Greetings and felicitations. Hello. I am Anti-Derivative Jill, and this is Indefinite Lunch and Infinite Combinations number 52. Today, we are reviewing the next original Star Trek original series episode in production order, The City on the Edge of Forever. And we had a guest lineup today, but we're going to go with who we have. We have, uh, I'm very happy to have Pop Culture Carrier here with me today. And hello, hello, everybody. I'm excited, too. Me, yeah. You know, and, and our other panelists, as they arrive, we will introduce them. And, but, but for now, thank you guys for being here. And also, I see several people here in the chat. We just, we just keep encountering classic after classic. And as I've said, I've said this multiple weeks in a row by now. And this week is, an, is, an, is no exception. I've lost track of actually how many how many weeks in a row I've said this. It'll be more interesting to see when I stop saying it. But it's still <laughs> true. So, yes, yes. so thank you for joining me today, Pop Culture Curator. I would like to remind everyone to make sure you're also subscribed to Pop Culture Curator. But I know most of you already are. So also make thank sure you. to click the bell so you know when he's live. Appreciate that. Yeah, last night, just last night, we just started our reviews on Lost in Space, which is a super sweet and fun sci-fi show. So come yeah, check it out. Fun. Yeah, right. Thank come you. Check I, it out. I had a blast. It was, it, I was. I was really excited. It went really well. Thank you. It really did. It was a lot of fun. Um, come check that out. Mondays at 8 p.m. Central Time. And what else do you have going, going on over there? We have something tonight. tonight. Uh, I have my horror sci-fi reviews tonight. We're covering the 1975 movie Death Race 2000. And on Wednesdays, I usually cover the original Gilligan's Island series. We're going into season two. And I also have a random uh, Rumleach from the Lab stream with open mic, open topic. Thank you. I appreciate it, Jill. I'm so oh, yeah, excited to be cool. here. Yeah, right? I mean, this episode. Um, for, for reference to the production of these episodes, um, some of the facts I share come from Star Trek 365, the original series by Paula M. Block and Terry J. Erdman. And the idea to use this comes from my friend R.M. Briggs, who you can find on the Clabburn Times channel. So everybody also subscribe to Clabburn Times and read Raquel's amazing short fiction stories, now available in paperback, hardback, and Kindle. And I think that my bot, if it's running, will randomly post those links. Um, and uh, and links to our other friends. So, with that said, let's look at the chat for a little bit and see who we got going here. We got hello to Edge of Time. Oh, oh, we lost some of our original chats. There were some chats before this. Oh. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I remember seeing some before before this one. But I don't know why it does that. Yeah, I know, right? I wanted to read the very first chat. But Edge of Time says, are you animal, vegetable, or mineral oil? Oh, oh, he's talking about they're, when they're trying to figure out what the Guardian is. Is it a yes. machine? Is it a bean? And he's like, I'm both. I'm awesome. Edge of Time says, fun fact, Harlan Ellison claimed to have intercourse with more than 5,000 women. Apparently, they were willing to help a fellow in need. Well, you know, I, I, I don't know. I, you know what? I, I have heard that he was a very dirty guy. <laughs> um, Edge of Time says, needles and sutures and bears. Oh, my. And hello to Canadian Spider-Man. And hello, also... Spidey. Yeah, hello, Spidey. Yeah. I hope you're having fun in Mexico. And also hello to Gorilla's Random Thoughts. Who says, hey everyone, hashtag Edith Keeler must die. Hashtag McCoy is tripping balls. Yes. Okay. Well, he is. Yes. On Cordrazine. Edge of Time says, hi Spidey. Hoping all your Mexa dreams come true. And that's from Edge of Time. And Captain Infinity is in the chat. He has a link if he wants to join us. If he doesn't, 
and then that's okay too. The chat is fine too. And Eugene Bird says the only time I thought of Joan Collins as being attractive, but who is a match for William Shatner in his prime? I agree. I think she looks best here. I don't like her in her later years where she had too much makeup. Is that what happened later? She wore too much makeup. Too much makeup when she's starting to get in a dynasty in the soap operas. Yeah. You know, well, the older she got, the more makeup. So it was kind of a progressive thing. Well, I used to, I used to love watching Married with Children. And I used to think that too, that that Peg would wear too much makeup because when she didn't have it, she looked beautiful. Yes, exactly. So I get that point. Franco Walker says, I need food. You're an hour early. <laughs> Hello. I'll just be lurking. <laughs> <laughs> you're right okay, you're okay, right okay. i i i do i do tend to start late but this is such a big episode i have to start early and early means actually on time kirk 130 says give me a few minutes i will call a zoom meeting and shut the door then i can chat okay great franco walker says hello and also, John Rendell is here. Hey, he says hello to you, Pop Culture Curator. Hello, hello, John. And Gorilla says, make sure to count how many times Kirk almost gets hit by a car. Just once. <laughs> wow, that was quick. Yeah, it was foreshadowing. So it was Eugene. intentional in the script. Aha. Uh -huh. Eugene Bird says, pigs in space, did you say? I love the Muppets. And not Brian is here. Hey, not Brian. He says A plus episode. Hi, all. Yes, and, good to see you, not Brian. And uh, yes, yes, that is part of our show today. Edith Keeler didn't need to die. Um, the way the episode is written, she needed to die. But with careful examination of time travel, uh, <laughs> it, it turns out the the authors of the episode couldn't know the characters definitely didn't know well it went through so she... many rewrites and it passed through so many hands before you know, right we got to get, you know what we got now well this is this is what happens though with episodes that are this great that fans come up with ways to enhance the episode and make yeah. it even better and so yeah, this right. is an example of one of those things hey, and hello there is. Yeah, hello, Darius Munchausen. Yeah, well, yeah, long time no see, Darius. Good to see you. Always great to see him. Matt G is also here. And Gorilla says, I swear it was four times, Pop. And oh, also, well, also, I could be wrong. James Caserta says, I'm here, oh, mighty Jill. <laughs> hello, James. Good to see you. And stream on spot wants you to subscribe to Cardinal Sin. That's always a good idea. And hello, Rancor Steve says, Howdy, Jill. Just stopping by real quick. Love what you're doing. <laughs> Thank you for stopping by, Rancor Steve. Yeah, great. And Cardinal Sin says, Hail, hail, the gang's all here. Yeah. So, with that said, let's check out the penultimate episode of season one of Star Trek. The city on the edge of forever. Also, before we do, uh, oh wait, okay, wait. I gotta share my my screen. I have, I have my slides. Cool. That I've got to share. We're all here. We're ready to share this episode. This is the chat is one of the today. one of the greatest episodes. Oops. <laughs> I accidentally shared the chat instead of. <laughs> Although, if you are in the chat, make sure to vote in the poll to tell us what you think of the episode or what grade you would give it. Also, hit that like button, please, and the notification bell for further streams. Yes. Also, hello to Phantom Boomer. Hello, Phantom Boomer. Oh, what a great picture. I love that. Where did you get that taken at? Oh, yes. So... So this, I don't mind this sharing this now since my child looks nothing like this anymore. Um, he's he's much taller now, and so this was taken at the 50th anniversary Star Trek convention in Las Vegas, 
And I hear these days they don't have the Garden of Forever around anymore. Oh, what a great set. It's very yeah. cool. Yeah, so I'm so glad I got to see it. I have to ask, did you step through it? <laughs> of oh, course. No. <laughs> <laughs> it was uh, allowed. It was allowed to step through it, so we did. Very cool. Mm -hmm. Yes. And yeah, I, I loved I loved this. This was the best aside from the actual Enterprise set. This was the best photo op prop they had. Yeah, it looks like you got a little trucker there in training. Yeah. yeah, I know. Actually, he got the fancier uniform because they didn't have the cheaper one for sale for kids. So I actually had oh. to get it specifically tailored just for him. <laughs> uh. <laughs> he came out as an old man. <laughs> Canadian Spider-Man says, Commodore, oh, oh, he's saying hello to Jim. And also Molecular Arts is here. Okay, so this, The City on the Edge of Forever, first aired on April 6, 1967. The episode was directed by Joseph Pebney. And the episode was written by Harlan Ellison. But we're not quite, we'll get back to him in a, in a few minutes. Because, I mean, this is, this is the least controversial Star Trek episode ever made. Wait, no, not not right. That's not <laughs> it. <laughs> not only do we have major controversy over the script, which adapts a very small percentage of uh, Harlan, Harlan Ellison's story and original screenplay, we we have a uh, we also have the issue of time travel. And the thing with the time travel is it, it's an expansion upon this story because. Here, here we have uh, a very important theory that has been explained on Captain Infinity's channel. If you want more explanations of it, subscribe to Captain Infinity, and he he talks about it quite often. And I know that he doesn't exactly like to hear the word theory applied to his facts, but the fact is only he and a few others and maybe the guardian of forever itself can understand that this episode traverses through multiple timelines, namely two throughout the course of the episode. And I say it this way because it is abundantly clear that the authors of the script and the characters within the script treat this story as a malleable timeline. And so as I go through the slides, I will relay the story as if it's a malleable timeline, because that is how it is written. But there is evidence to presume that second timeline. And and definitely go subscribe to Captain Infinity's channel to hear more about that. And I would like to welcome to the stream Scotty R37. Hello. Hello there. How mm -hmm. are you? Hello? I'm doing great. Okay. I'm so happy you're here. Me too. I'm <laughs> sorry I'm late. No, that's okay. I I just I wanted to be sure to start the stream because this is such a big episode, and I want to make sure we have a good a good time to to relax with it and talk about it. Super true. Mm -hmm. So, how are you doing? I'm okay. I'm playing nurse to Snoopy, but aside from that, everything uh, is fine. No, Poor no biggie. Snoopy. He is He's the strongest dog on the planet. So okay, good. Yeah. Don't worry about him. He'll be fine. No, now I'm worried. Don't, don't. He's just hungover. That's all. <laughs> okay. Uh, and I wanted to say hello in the chat to Gary Ambrosia. He, hey, Gary. He's also saying hello to this awesome chat. And Darius says, wow, my mom was in 10th grade on April 6th, 1967. My dad was in the army. Nice. I'm a veteran. My dog needs a vet. Just, just joking. Just funning, guys. <sighs> you, you knew, you knew what that was going to do to me, Scotty. No, I didn't. No, you. How do you think I? Don't worry about it. Sleepy's <laughs> fine. He's okay. He just, he just had a little too much cortisone. That's all. Okay. Cardinalson says, "Here's how you know that modern uh, Star Trek is effed up. The reason they took this away from Harlan." Is because there was drug 
there was drugs in it. And Gene Runberry said, no Starfleet officer would sell drugs. And that's true. Right. They wanted to make Scotty a drug dealer. Like, what? No, oh, no, there was, the, no, there was a different character. Um, there was actually, okay, it's not like uh, it took I, away from Ellison, but what happened was the mm -hmm. original script was unshootable because, I mean, he he wanted a mastodon to come jumping out of the... Uh, oh, right. To, uh, right. So there was like a lot of reasons why they had to rewrite the episode. Yes. And the drug mm -hmm. issue was just one of them. But it wasn't that mm -hmm. specific reason why it was rewritten. But that is one really good reason because in Star Trek, of course, you don't want Starfleet officers being drug dealers. Correct. Yeah. <laughs> well, and even to the point where it's not uh, no Starfleet officer would sell drugs. It's just that uh, drug addiction itself would no longer be an issue in the 23rd century. Don't forget, we're talking about a Precisely. utopia here. Exactly. And uh, Bantam Boomer says in 1967, he was in high school. I don't know how the world got on without me because I wasn't even around in 1967. Me neither. There you go. How did they do it without us, Jill? I, I Pop, have no I'm assuming, idea. Well, I'm assuming you was... were born in 1981? The world was or in not. black and white, and then we it were was. born. Yes. <laughs> they didn't even have AM radio in 1967. It's crazy. So, um, Canadian Spider-Man says, Jill really likes it when we all hit the like button, since it helps push this channel out into the YouTube verse. True. It helps grow the channel too. So if you like this entertainment, please thumbs up. Like, like, like. Thank like, you. Like, 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 Thank like, you, like. Spidey. And Darius Munchausen says, You're around my mom's age, Phantom Boomer. You really are a boomer. Nice. <laughs> And so everybody's saying hello to each other in the chat. Molecular Arts says my mom and pa were married one year in 19, 1967. Man, that was a good year. Oh, yeah. I do try not to talk too much about the filth in, in the, when we're talking about the original series. But yes, in Kurtzman Trek, Starfleet officers are on. Oh, uh, yeah. See, that doesn't fit in this, this, uh, this live stream. But thank you, Darius. It's true. Canadian Spider-Man says, another trip to the beach this afternoon to burn myself a little more. Things are toasty and perfect. Delicious. Uh, Not Brian says, Edith should have gone back with them to the Enterprise. She wouldn't have needed to die, and she could have seen the stars. Hashtag happy ending. Yeah, that yes. is true. That is very true. I agree with that. However. Yeah. Oh, but the paradoxical nature of this particular time ta travel event, like, I don't know, there's so many things going on that it, well, if they take Edith, then she wouldn't have died in the car accident. And therefore, Spock wouldn't have seen the obituary making it so they wouldn't anyway. Well, see, if, if it's a malleable timeline the way the authors intended, then you're absolutely correct. The paradox would preclude Edith coming back with Kirk, but if it is, a, in fact, a multiple time timeline, then she could go back to a different timeline and not have any effect on the but other timeline. As it's presented here, it seems pretty malleable. Oh, no, yeah. No, it's written malleable. Okay, cool. Okay, cool. <laughs> but I enjoy the exploration of the multiple time travel possibilities. For sure, absolutely. James Caserta says, cool story would be going back and saving her by bringing her to the future. Yeah. And hello to Berta Prey 5. Hey, her Berta dying Prey. maybe was needed. Yes. Kabla, yeah. Berta Prey. Yes, they say it in the episode. Yeah, and that is a gut punch when Spock is like, Edith Keeler must die. And it's like, oh, wow. All right. Yes, that's right. But to give a little credence to the multiple time travel theory, you have the Guardian of Forever, which throws off um, logical the logical underpinnings of how time and time travel works. That's why when Spock is gathering the time fluctuation readings on his tricorder, he has to admit that none of the science he knows correlates with the reality that's coming from the Guardian. 
The Guardian exists in all times. It's non-linear, lives in the past, present, and future all at once. So it bypasses the normal flow of time, allowing McCoy to end up uh, end up in uh, the city, Chicago. Ah, uh, New York. I think. New York, New York. Okay. Save Edith and change history, uh, allowing for Germany to win. But it's not a deletion of the timeline. It, it th- this is this is part of the multiple time travel theory, multiple timeline theory. It is a separate timeline that is created, and the crew on the planet find themselves on a new timeline where the Enterprise doesn't exist because humanity never reached that dystopia. I mean, utopia. Sorry. Right. Yes. And we know that the Guardian accepts the truth of the two different timelines because Spock records all of this information on his tricorder. Once on the planet, we have fun watching Spock build the computer. Um which he can eventually use to hook up to his tricorder. And from that tricorder, we see that the Guardian stored both timelines and Kirk and Spock have to make sure to get back to the correct timeline. And so that that's part of um, part of a multiple time travel theory there. And I just bring that up first because for you and I, as we understand it, and the way that the creators of the episode and the characters understand it, these realities are not favored exactly by the script. Um except for the evidence given by Spock's tricorder. Therefore, for the rest of the review, I will be talking uh, about the episode as it is written, as malleable timeline. And now, speaking of authorship, I do believe we have the writer of this episode, Harlan Ellison, um, who has some opinions regarding his original screenplay. And the one adapted to fit within the Star Trek universe, written by Jean L. Kuhn, Dorothy, Dorothy Fontana, and Jean Roddenberry. But but um, the written by for this episode is only given to Harlan. I'm not sure why they don't put teleplay by. But Well, he didn't do the teleplay. Right, exactly. So I was thinking the teleplay should be by Jean L. Kuhn and Dorothy Fontana. But it was Joe, both Jean, Jean Kuhn and... And Jean Roddenberry. Um, yes. Um, and Dorothy, I, and yeah, basically it went through a lot of hands. But if I remember correctly, one of the requests that Harlan Ellison made was because mm-hmm. they had changed his original script so much. And stop me if you covered this already. No, uh, we haven't yet. We're we're, he, we're there. <laughs> he used great. Uh, he used. Uh, he wanted to use his uh, pseudonym, but whenever Harlan Ellison used a pseudonym on televised science fiction, it was basically his brand saying, "I wrote a story and they messed it up." And so Gene Roddenberry was like, well, no, because if you say that we messed up your science fiction story, then other science fiction novelists won't participate in the show. And so that was why the full credit could have been given. But it was definitely a contentious ownership of the story to begin with. But he basically Gene Roddenberry wanted uh, Harlan Ellison's name on the show. Yeah, on the one hand, Harlan Nelson derides the changes, and on the other, he's perfectly happy to accept the Hugo Award and, you know, grow and, people at the ceremony. And when he did, it was a slap in the face to the people who actually wrote the teleplay. Yes. So, I I believe that Pop Culture Curator is prepared to tell us all about Harlan Ellison, so I would like to uh, allow him to give us a start-off point. Uh, of this 10-month arduous tale of production. Okay, thank you. I'll do the best to summon it up. This is from Inside Star Trek, The Real Story by Herb Solo and Bob Jussman. And there's so many... There, There's like a, more than one chapter mm-hmm. on this, so it's, it's kind of incredible. Uh, but basically what happened was Har- Harlan Ellison worked on this for months. And the usual time for somebody working on a script for Star Trek was just a matter of weeks. But Harlan Ellison apparently uh, couldn't work that fast. And he was very delayed. He didn't like to be pushed or pressured. Let me find my page that I have. Yeah, he, he apparently he started working on it as production started on the show itself. Yes. And uh, according to Bob Jessman, he says by the time the series... Production began, we were already hurting for scripts and wanted to get a teleplay from Harlan as soon as possible. But despite a lot of badgering, Harlan was behind schedule right from the start. 
taking two months to write his final revised story outline. The usual time allocation for a story was more like two or three weeks. Although his story outline contained inherent production problems, I loved it. And in a memo to John D.F. Black wrote, don't ever tell Harlan, but this outline is beautifully written. The fact that it may become rather difficult to achieve the effects that he has written into his story is another matter. I mentioned a few problem areas. The time vortex is described as a shimmering pillar of light set between the gray silver rocks. It would be nice if we could find a cheaper time vortex. And on page 10, the Earthmen reel back in astonishment as the behemoth bulk of a giant woolly mammoth burst out of the foliage within the time vortex device. At the same time, Bob Jasmine reels back in agony as he does not believe there is any color stock film available on mastodons bursting out of foliage or even giant woolly mammoths. In summation, my analysis was plenty sets, plenty speaking parts, plenty extras, plenty locations, plenty shooting time, plenty money, plenty night for night shooting, Plenty of screams from management accompanied by dire threats and reflections upon our immediate ancestry. After a few weeks, however, Arlen complained that we were... That what they did is they relegated him to... He was delaying and delaying and delaying. Finally, they ordered him to come to uh, parent, our Desilu Studios and right there on the, uh, on the lot. Right. Kind of like misery. Huh? Yes. Every now and then, visitors to our office building were surprised, were surprised at the sight of Harlan cartwheeling down the long narrow corridor unwinding while he took a break from the typewriter the cubby hole office we had assigned to harlan was too confining it was also the show's wardrobe storage room so harlan had to endure lots of interruptions luckily he liked to work at night and there were times when harlan seeking to get a breath of air would escape he'd lock his office door from the inside put on some loud music and climb through the office window onto the studio street to go oh visit God. the shooting company <laughs> on stage Occasionally, he would stand in the park like a stranger. Yep. Yes. Occasionally, he would stand in the park between Lucy's bungalow and the Desi, admin, Desi Lu administration building and yell up to her solo second floor office, Herbie, can you come out and play now? Herb worried that Lucy would overhear and misunderstand Harlan's sense of humor. After a few weeks, Har however, Harlan complained that we were forcing him to, quote, work under inhumane and inhuman and inhumane conditions. Since we desperately needed his final tele his final draft teleplay, I arranged for Harlan to work and sleep inside my office until he finished the script. It was really a jail sentence. I'm looking, I'm locking you in every night, Harlan, so the sooner you finish, the sooner you can go free. Harlan would never accept this imprisonment, as he termed it, if he didn't trust me. And then it goes on to explain that the two had worked together on the Outer Limits episode, The Demon with the Glass Hand, and how that was also unshootable because Harlan wanted uh, chase scenes all over the city. And they were saying, well, you know, on, on the budget and the time constraints, there's no way we could do it. So he took Harlan Ellison <clears throat> to the famous Bradbury building in Los Angeles and explained to him that instead of having chase scenes all through the city, we could start from the basement and go all the way up to the roof. And by the time we get to the roof, we can complete our story, and Harlison loved that idea. And that's how that story eventually came about, which also won multiple awards. So Harlan was a very, very talented writer, and he was a genius, very smart. He just had to be reined in and, and kind of set limits on it. Yeah, production couldn't match his imagination. And, yes, exactly. and, and not only that, the script on se at several points didn't line up with Star Trek, the characters, or the way that the show is created. So that's why it had to be so heavily rewritten. Yes, he did write the first teleplay. That took three weeks. And that's when they saw it and said, that yes, it's better than it was, but it's still unfilmable because obviously it wanted too much time and too much budget. Too much time, too much budget, and right. people were out of character. <clears throat> Seems that John Rendell has to take off, just so you know. Oh, thank you. Take thank care, you, John. Scotty. Bye, John Rendell. Have a good day. Oh, he says, time travel hurts my brain. And does he have any more? Let's see. He also, he's saying hello. And he also says, let's see. Uh, unfortunately, I got to run and get groceries while it's warm out. Have a great show. I'll see you Wednesday. 
on KDTV. Yes, on King Dolphin TV tomorrow, we will be having a radio play, uh, including some of Raymond's Dolphin Dolphin War, um, a, a Dolphin War chapter. It's a dramatic one too. It's really good. So stop by tomorrow and hear me perform that. Thank you, John Rendell. See you later. Yeah, thanks for coming by, John. Good to see you. And Matt G just tipped a dollar tonight. Matt G. <laughs> tonight on Xanadoom TV. Internet Bixen Anti-Derivative Jill stars in Whataburger on the Edge of Forever. <laughs> this burger isn't eight ounces. The power of Jill. Unfortunately, this burger must die. <laughs> that's that's hilarious. I don't even know where I was in the chat. Ew. Okay, there I am. I had a star. Oh, good. Mm -hmm. I'm the ball. Oh, um, pop culture curator. Was that all it had about Harlan? There's more that I can edit later. If you, what you can catch up on the chat if you'd like. Okay, because <laughs> I remember there was like weird stuff in it, like gremlins or something. I forget what, but anyway, okay. Yeah, I'll try. Sure, I'll catch up on the chat. Um, Bird of Prey 5 says, Curious they put that line in the preview for the next episode. <clears throat> I think he means the Edith Keeler must die line. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's right. Molecular. Molecular. Molecular Mo art. I know how to say molecular. I know you do. <laughs> molecular art. Molecular art says. Nebula. <laughs> the Hollywood of today would have made City on the Edge of Hillary Clinton's election. What? No, it would have been on. It would have been City on the Edge of Stacey Abrams. <laughs> right. Jim says when reviewing a Star Trek video, you need to watch the video a couple of times to get your facts straight. Agreed. And, um, yeah. Bird of Prey 5 says, in my head canon, this event creates the mirror universe. Well, I don't want to step on what pop culture is going to say, but apparently that was one of the possibilities after McCoy goes through. They beam up and they find the pirate <clears throat> vessel Condor. Yes. And it was going to be basically the mirror universe. So they just saved that and used it later. Right. So that, that did influence the Mirror Mirror episode. Which, of course, Ellison did not get credit for. Oh, really? Neat. Yep. In fact, I was thinking it would have been a nice two-parter. They could have done this if they could have combined the script and shot it that way, you know, instead of two separate episodes. But I'm happy the way it turned out. Yeah. So two of the, the best Star Trek episodes are connected somehow. That's really yep. cool. And hello to LDG, Free the Net. Hello, LDG. Hey, LDG. Good to see you. Free the net org slash the underground. If I'm right. So, Bird, you are right. It's not just headcanon. That's originally how it was envisioned. Um, you're reading. Okay. So, Molecular Art says, I have insomnia. And Gary Ambrosia says, My favorite scene in this episode is McCoy reflecting on the horror of 20th, 20th century medicine. Mine and too. The last time he does it again in Star Trek Four. Yes, it is an incredible, incredible acting performance there. I love it. And Phantom Boomer says Ellison uses his pseudonym on the Star Lost. That is correct. What's the Star Lost? And... Uh, it's a series that he wrote. Oh, oh, it's a series he wrote and he took his name off of it. Oh yes, that's cool. I think Harlan Ellison is one of the most punk rock writers of the night uh, of the 20th century. So it's awesome to hear how ornery he is. Well, according, yeah, to, this, he, according to this book, when they he, kept saying Harlan, you got to rein this in. <laughs> this is unshootable. I mean, mastodons. I mean, all this and this and that. And he said, "Come on, you can shoot it for 98 cents." Yep. Yeah. Well, he's also kind of a jerk too. He is. He, is. <laughs> he did have that, an ego. Yes, he did. Um, well, the worst thing he did was he groped somebody at the Hugo Awards. I don't think he, that was the only place that he groped people. Yeah, that's true. Well, yeah, he grabbed somebody's boobs. Um, Canadian Spider-Man says, 
Yeah, that's that stuck with me as well, Gary Ambrosia. Ambrosia. And I like McCoy because he asks those kind of questions. And so, oh, oh and people are talking about chat GPT uh, in the chat, which is a really interesting topic. I think one of my Fridays is going to have to cover that topic. Cool. I just don't know yet how to frame it. John Scotto says, I remember from many years ago at an old style Star Trek convention that he complained how his real script was destroyed by Gene Roddenberry and he didn't want his name on the final script. Well, if you're an author, you will be lucky if your script is as destroyed as this one was. <laughs> because this is a this is a great episode. John Rendell says, unfortunately, I got to run. Oh, yeah, I read that one. Thanks to Scotty. Well, thanks to John Rendell. He's the one who wrote it. <laughs> All right. Thanks to John Rendell, too. And John Scotty says, Harlan was a genius, but he absolutely didn't want to follow style guide or character reference. Notes. Right. He didn't read the Bible for the show. He didn't. Uh, he didn't. Uh, right. If you're if you're a writer for a TV show, the TV show generally wants you to right for the tv show <laughs> right he didn't like constraints no which is fine if you're creating your own work but if you're writing for a show they, they need you to follow some rules or and that's what happens when you hire someone as eccentric as him well it kind of it kind of reminds me in a loose way it's like everybody knows that sean connery is scottish but when he shows up to play anything that isn't scottish he still has the scottish accent so when you hire harlan ellison to write a science fiction story he comes back with a science fiction story and then production is like we can't shoot this and it's like um i'm sorry i thought you asked me to write a science fiction story and i did the production did. part is your problem yeah i know and then and then that is what happened yeah the writers for the show ended up having to take his script and they made something wonderful out of what he made oh absolutely yeah and molecular art says especially oh wait what i reflect on the horror of 21st century medicine especially the mutilation oh yeah yeah i don't know oh, exactly about about that. yeah that's the orville oh well but that's not in the 21st century Oh, no, but the child, well, I don't want to repeat it, but. Oh, it's an allegory. Um, but that Topa was was born um, a female, so she, she was just going back to who she was. Right, but, but it, anyway, but it though. Was, it was about, it was about the, uh, sexual transition. Yeah, right. The The episode was framed poorly uh, and uh, mis, it was misconstrued that way. I definitely agree that the. Because it was framed to make you think that way. I, I get it. it. It wasn't written very well. It could have been a wonderful story. Well, everything um, changed when Disney bought it. Yeah. And But you know what, though? After seeing a uh, recent new trick, I, I, I get softer on season three of the Oroville every day <laughs> because of that. <laughs> so hello to King Dolphin Raymond R.M. Feliciano. Hello. Hello, Raymond. Good to see you there, sir. And say hello to Sandra, please. Yes. And Franka Walker says, I forgot how hard it is to make ham and cheese toasty with a cat in the room. Huh? Oh, yeah. Cats and their cheese. They shouldn't have the cheese. They're lactose intolerant by nature, but they love it. And Raymond says, this was absolutely one of my top five TOS and one of the best in television. And Captain Finity says, I use constraints and canon synonymously. Cordwood Bird. That's the name of the, of, thank Cord you. Wayne. Yeah. The name of? Cord Wiener. Cord Wiener. What's the uh, relation? The that's the pseudonym of Harlan Ellison when he wanted to disown a televised uh, Yes. Thank you. To so, Wilson, yeah. Yeah. Cord Wainer Bird is what he called himself. Great. Which is a made up name. Like, come on, Cord Wainer? When was the last time you met anybody named Cord Yeah, Wainer? I know. Espar is much cooler. Yeah. 
John Scotto says Harlan was in stark contrast to David Gerald, who took most changes in stride again all her decades ago at a convention. Nice. I like those classic conventions. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I wish I could have been there. Um, Harlan Ellison won Best Adapted Screenplay of the Year and won a Hugo for it, which is awarded by the fans. Yeah, he won an award for his original story and then also for the, the script that Gene Alcoon, Dorothy Fontana, and Gene Roddenberry wrote. And hello to Ravenscroft82. Hey, Ravencroft. Molecular Art says Star Wars was written. Tote Star Wars was written by Chat GPT. Oh, okay. Yeah, right. Because Chat GPT can now write scripts. Yes. Uh, yeah, see, that's a whole other topic, but that is an interesting one. Cardinal Sin says, uh, ask me to try looking up Harlan Ellison's book online, which has both both his original screenplay and the one that was used for Star Trek, and see if you can pull it down and help make it useful. Mm-hmm. Yes. Flipping the bird. Okay, so I'm going to put a star there because we've got to start on this episode. So now we're finally at the story. Because, I mean, unless you've got, yeah, um, if you want to add any story differences between the script and Harlan Ellen's, Harlan's, <laughs> it, 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 yeah, um, pop culture character, if you, if you feel like adding anything, if you see anything interesting. Well, for, for the pacing of this stream, let's go ahead and start this. Yes, that's what I'm going to do. But um, yeah. like, if, if then, you if you feel like you, you, you found something cool, just let me know. Okay, so, cool. So the Enterprise is at red alert as she orbits um, this muddy-looking planet. Every so often, the ship is shaking. And yeah, I know last night I was just telling you on your show, Pop Culture Curator, that the console explosions are not as big on Star Trek as they are in Lost in Space. Well, this one <laughs> this one uh, kind of is an exception. Right, it is a big one. It knocks Sulu out. Yes, there Here it is. Here we are. It, it also looks like it was kind of uncomfortable for the actor. <laughs> yeah, you would think so. So, Sulu's console explodes and he's thrown to the floor unconscious. Spock doesn't necessarily explain how he can detect the ripples in time, but I think that's because this is early Star Trek, and they haven't yet invented our fictional chronoton emissions yet. That makes sense. So Kirk sends all the data they have so far to Starfleet, and in order to revive Sulu, McCoy injects him with a little cordrazine. Also, big shout out to Yeoman Clare. Oh, her only holding... appearance. <laughs> I wish I I wish I could say that her name is really Claire, but Scotty likes to attribute. Um, I just like making names. up names. He likes making up names for our our um, red shirts and side characters who don't it's have Yeoman names. Yeoman Uh I Claire Yordwainer. Claire Cordwainer, yes. Okay. <laughs> so they're they're passing through ripples in time. And in order to revive Sulu, McCoy injects him with a little codrazine, which can be used to stimulate the heart in measured, dose, measured doses, and it works for Sulu. But as they hit some kind of space displacement caused by the time ripples, McCoy, who still has the hypo of codrazine in his hand, accidentally injects himself in the stomach with the stuff. The entire right, content. In the original draft, it was a crew member dealing drugs named Beckwith, but instead they used McCoy getting accidentally injected. Yes. Yes, it being an accident that he takes a bunch of drugs is much better in Star Trek than, yes. than, than, than drug dealing. Right, the two not, people not, drug dealing, right. That would not, yeah. yeah. Not, not just for the person dealing the drugs, but then there's also a buyer who is ingesting the drugs. Correct. I mean, the Ensign Beckwith is late. Why? He's on the heroin again. And this is also, by the way, the most expensive uh, episode of the entire series. Um. Oh, it is. Is it the most expensive? I heard it was the 
third most expensive next to the two pilots. Oh, well, yeah, well, yeah that, it, that's what, well, yeah. It says this was the most expensive episode produced during the first season with a budget of $245,316 and also the most expensive episode of the entire series except the two pilots. The average the cost of the first season episode, yes, the average cost of the first season episode was around $190,000. Also, production went one and a half days over schedule, resulting in eight shooting days instead of the usual six. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, the production was wild. The insanity, okay, so the insanity that, the insanity that, um, that is happening to me currently in trying to relay the sentence. Okay, so it, it happens almost instantly with McCoy because he's gotten an overdose of Codrazine. And victims of Codrazine, of course, a fictional <laughs> Star Trek medicine, but in small doses, it'll help your heart. But if you overdose, the victim suffers from delirium, violent behavior, and paranoia. This stuff even makes you forget who your friends and acquaintances are and leaves you feeling dreadful and like you're in danger. Further, McCoy is feeling confused, weak, and is, uh, and is going to have a high fever to go with what we'll see later with his pale green and red splotchy skin. And, oh, we have our first captain's log here. Yay. Captain's log. Bones is nuts. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Please read it. Pop culture character. <laughs> oh, okay. I was kidding. Uh, Captain's log. Supplemental entry. Two drops of cord resin can save a man's life. A hundred times that amount has just accidentally been pumped into Dr. McCoy's body. In a strange, wild frenzy, he has fled the ship's bridge. All connecting decks have been placed on alert. We have no way of knowing if the madness is permanent or temporary, or in what direction it will drive McCoy. Yeah. Nurse gives him the double karate chop. <laughs> yeah, it's so funny that right after watching Lost in Space, you get the exploding console and a karate chop. Well, you get two karate chops in two days. Mm -hmm. And and then after taking out the transporter chief, McCoy you know, I like that they handled it that way because it, it would have it would not have been. Uh, Becoming a McCoy dish, he could have easily had a phaser and stunned the guy with the phaser, but that wouldn't have been becoming. So even McCoy in, in his a crazy rage fueled uh, delirium, he was still basically gentle because it was just karate chop that knocked the guy out. So I kind of like that. That's a great point. I like that for his character. Right. And right, he doesn't run around, even though this drug is supposed to make you violent. He mostly takes on the paranoid portion of that, the of the effects, and is more scared of other people coming to kill him yes. and others. Right, he just wants to escape. Mm -hmm. So that that is an amazing point. I love it. Okay, so so Kirk puts together a landing party to go down the to the planet to go after McCoy, and the landing party is Kirk, Spock, Scotty, Ahura. And two security officers. And so and so we see the set here. They they um they mixed up so the set designers mixed up runes with runes. Right. Yeah. Right. Harlan Ellison wrote runes, R U N E S, but they mistake mistook it for ruins, R U I N S. But once Ellison saw the set, he was happy with it. Yeah, I'm happy with it. It looks great. And so, of course, we get the Guardian. And Kirk and Spock examine it. And Spock thinks it's unbelievable. This single object is the source of all the time displacement. And Kirk asks, asks for an ex explanation, and Spock says, I can't. For this to do what it does is impossible. 
by any science I understand. It is operating even now, putting out waves and waves of time displacement, which we picked up millions of miles away. The original story had the time portal manned by people who were the real guardians of time rather than a machine entity. Mm. And of course, seeing uh, one of the best things to see is uh, is Ahura in the landing party. So I love seeing her at work searching for McCoy. But then there he is. He uh, McCoy pops out from behind a rock after she and her security uh -huh. guard have passed by. Looking even more crazier than before. <laughs> yes. Now the red splotches have started. Yes. And Kirk and Spock continue to examine the Guardian. But I can't read for the Guardian. I need a... Who wants to be the Guardian? Do you, do you want to read the stage direction and I'll do the, I'll do the voice? Okay. Okay. The, the donut pulses bright in time with the words. A question. Since before your sun burned hot in space and before your race was born, I have awaited a question. Kirk says, what are, what are you? I am the guardian of forever. And also, I would like to say that in uh, adhering to the rules regarding the filth, I did not say, I am Carl. Thank you. No problem. But then when Spock questions why, okay, so then they also ask if he's a machine or a being, and the Guardian says that he's both and neither, that he's his own beginning and own ending. But then when Spock questions why the Guardian speaks in riddles, the Guardian says, I answer as simply as your level of understanding makes possible. And I just love the looks that Spock gives at being told that he cannot possibly understand the science of the, that the Guardian is using. Miss, Mr. Spock, you basic. Almost the... Spock is almost, uh, has almost the preliminary emotions towards the fence without actually giving off that emotion. I think it's really brilliant the way he's coming to his own as Spock at this point. And Spock correctly deduces that the Guardian, that the Guardian is a time portal to other times and dimensions. And dimensions could also mean other realities, which can give credence to multiple timelines, even though of course, this episode presents as malleable. It's important to note the language of the episode is written as a malleable timeline, but that there's cause to believe that the episode has multiple timelines. And we, we get to see the images in The Guardian to see how it is a portal through time. There it is. A gateway to your past, if you wish. Most used by uh, stock footage from old Paramount movies, but uh, just as effective as seeing a mastodon emerge. Sure, I I do love elephants though, so that might have been fun. You but know how expensive it is to rent an elephant. That's true. Maybe they could have gotten that tiger from the other episode and put some long teeth on it. We could have had a <laughs> tiger. That would have been cool. And we get a lot of stock footage from old Paramount movies. And McCoy finally appears, ranting about killers. So Scotty and a guard manage to grab him, and um, Spock neck pinches him. And Spock realizes at this point that he can record the history presented by the Guardian with his tricorder and begins to do so. But by now, no one realizes that McCoy is woken up, and he makes a run for the Guardian. And he's able to leap through it. And that's what's going to happen in just a moment. 
There we are. We'll get there. Yeah. There he goes. He needs time travel to the past. What past? The episodes, the episode, the authors, and all of Star Trek history says our past. So, so that's the way we're presenting it today. But it is reasonable to assume that it's a new timeline that he passes into, and Kirk and Spock follow into a new timeline, or or this or this altered history, whichever you will, has affected everything externally to the planet. Everyone on the planet appears to be in a bubble of the original timeline. So we still have our landing party with their gear. And this is because of the powers of the Guardian of Forever. But outside of the planet, the Enterprise and the Federation itself is gone. Uhura cannot contact the ship. And the Guardian confirms... Your vessel, your beginning, all that you knew is gone. Nice. And, and Sorry, I'm just Friday. complimenting your reading. No, go. Keep going. It's great. <laughs> well, actually, I wanted to ask you to read. Could you okay, read I'll... the private chat? No, but I liked it when you were being the guardian of forever. Anyway, okay, fine. Uh, not okay, fine. Um, Captain's log? Yes. Okay. Sorry. Mm -hmm. I'll say that with a little bit more authority. Uh, Captain's log, no stardate. For us, time does not exist. McCoy, back somewhere in the past, has affected a change in the course of time. All Earth history has been changed. There is no Starship Enterprise. We have only one chance. We have asked the Guardian to show us Earth's history again. Spock and I will go back into time ourselves and attempt to set right what once went wrong. Sorry, whatever <laughs> it was that McCoy changed. Yeah, exactly. This does feel like a bit of a quantum leap episode. And Spock picked the right moment to start recording because now he can estimate the time that McCoy jumped to. So he can take himself and Kirk to the brief window of time before McCoy got there to stop him from altering history, as the episode says, or altering timeline B, which we have found, which which we have found has no enterprise or federation. Either way, the universe is better with the federation around. Uh oh. What's happening? I do not know. Scotty wishes them good luck, and Ahura wishes them happiness. Well, and don't forget, he also tells them that if we don't come back, you guys need to go through the Guardian and choose a place or a time to live. Good point. Well, not to not to go live specifically. Like, firstly, just like you, if we fail. Wait as long as you think it, sh it should take. And you go try. Like, you go try and get McCoy. But as it turns out at the end of the episode, it's almost like they felt like no time had passed. Well, and if they don't have that tricorder, they have no way of knowing when to jump through. True. The only reason why they know Spock and uh, Kirk know when to jump through is because Spock has it logged on the tricorder. I, I'm, just, I'm just saying, Kirk says, you must make an attempt. Or at least find some world to live your days out yes yeah. totally but he does world. say he does say first and foremost you know you got to give it a go and i was thinking too i mean don't you think if that if that would have happened it probably would have been smart for all of them to jump through at the same time rather than separately in different times wouldn't you think at yeah least live together that, makes sense. Separate? that that does make sense because if they fail and their enterprise is no more the federation is no more the rest of the landing party is stranded on this planet. So it would make sense for them to be able to find Kirk and Spock to live in 1930s. New York, yeah. New York. Stone knives and bearskins. Yes, agreed. It, but I guess, I don't know why, why the whole landing party didn't go. I do like the poster. Yes, they leap through the wall with the poster for boxing at Madison Square Gardens. Which Welcome is used later on in DS9. Yeah, that's right. DS9 in that episode. Mm -hmm. With them. Yeah, Bird can probably tell us. Bird's the uh, genius when it comes to DS9. It actually, the poster does say it's a rematch the first time since Madison Square Gardens 
uh, when they are going back in time, looking at oh, what is the? It's the two-part episode with the sanctuary districts, isn't it? Yeah. Yes, that's right. With the sanctuary districts, past tense. That's the one. Thanks, Bird. But- <laughs> Yes, thank you. So, right. Speaking of the chat, I've got a bunch of them. So Ooh, let's see where. Busy, busy. I know, right? Oh. Okay. So, thank you for starring the chat for me, Scotty. Oh no, you did that. I did. Yeah. I don't remember. Okay. Molecular art says, "Can ten gallon hats hold ten gallon?" Then thank you to past Jill. And Phantom Boomer says, Card Wayner Smith was the pen name for sci-fi author Paul Myron Anthony Line Barger. <laughs> what? Wow. Wow. Those made up names. No, I'm joking. <laughs> Is baby powder made of babies? No. The answer, simply, no. No. <laughs> Molecular arts is hilarious. So James Caserta says he even ripped off the pen name. Nice. Thank you, James. Yes, I, I did hear that he had a lot of trouble with, with the plagiarism and stuff. And the Canadian Spider-Man says, bad kitty <laughs> to Franco Walker. Oh, because Franco Walker is making a sandwich and having trouble with the kitty who wants the sandwich. Yum, yum. Mm-hmm. And hello to Subcommander Tall, listening in while he drives it home from work. Greetings, some commander. And John Scudder says Kirk also gets chastised for giving medical advice. Who me? I like that line. There's a lot of little playful banter back and forth between Kirk, Kirk and Spock, and Kirk and McCoy. It's all it's really good for the the Trinity. Mm-hmm. Cardinal Sin asks pop culture carrier a question. Does it say how much Harlan Ellis Ellison got paid? Not that I saw. I'm sure it was a scale flat rate is the uh, same as the other is, but I will look it up and see if I can find it. Miss uh, Sub Commander Tall says Mr. Kyle always gets assaulted in the transporter room. Whoa, is well, that just it, a theme for transporter it's in, chiefs to it's suffer? It's in his job description. Yeah. I've been going over my contract for transporter technician, and it says here get punched out a lot. Is that supposed to be here? Oh, yes. It's a, it's a hazard. It's a hazard. Be prepared, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Franco Walker says transporter chiefs aren't very strong, are they? They always get knocked out. And John Scoto says, saw this episode first, uh, first in reruns in the mid-70s, but it's just as engaging now, 50 years later. So true. Oh, and Gary Ambrosia has to get to work now. You guys are great. Hail anti-derivative Jill and the intrepid chat. Cheers, Gary. Have a great day at work, Gary. Catch him tomorrow at Pop Culture Breakdown on Doomcock's channel at Overlord DVD. And John Scoto says, we're closing in on when the Guardian insults Spock. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we got there. <laughs> yeah. And and Spock takes it in stride. It's great. Dark Helmet says, as usual, I come here and I am lost as normal since this is TOS. But gotta give Jill the view at least. Oh wow. Well, thank you for being here, Dark Helmet. Cheers, Dark Helmet. Good to see you. Mm-hmm. Oh, and there's Arm Briggs Patreon. And Captain Finity says, it's a new past. And that's the only possible explanation. And I I am presenting the episode as it is written as a malleable timeline. But I I do prefer the multiple timeline way of rewriting the episode. It's a lot of fun. John Skoto says, "The the stark new reality hits them. Great job of establishing tension and fear. Uh, uh, Captain Finney says, otherwise you get, I'm here, but I'm not here. <laughs> yes. As per uh, Clabber and Time's review of Ch- the Children of Time, Deep Space Nuggets. 
which was a really good review last Saturday on his channel. Kronos is here. Hi, Kronos. Hey, Kronos. He says, OG Trek is the bestest Trek and that he likes this episode. Me too. And and uh, Dark Helmet stretches and sips whiskey. Delish. Frank Walker says the risk of screwing up time increases every time someone steps through. That, yeah, is, just... that is true. I agree. Yeah. Well, with the butterfly, with the chaos theory, just the, the, just the act of going through time and breathing and existing true. can change that. John Scoto says, but Kirk was also trying to limit the possible damage to the rest of the landing party, since what happens up upon going through is unknown. Oh, okay. oh, the reason why the whole landing party didn't go. And Kronos is not a fan of that two-parter, the Deep Space Nine past tense episode. Um, I, It's kind of okay. I like it. Dark Helmet says, as someone that knows little to nothing about TOS, how has the popularity grown or roughly stayed the same? Well, it's grown from since it started. Mm -hmm. But, I don't know, it's kind of shrunk because of the bad stuff that's been released recently. Well, and if there's a funny reference to... Um... Uh, to Star Trek in Wayne's world of all places where Wayne and Garth are talking to somebody and it's like it's kind of like Star Trek the next generation while it may be popular it will never outgrow the iconic nature of the original that's true and so I think it's grown and especially considering um, again more modern track like if you if you don't like it there's a uh, there's 79 episodes uh, of awesomeness including the alternative factor that is great. And for me, there's 735 episodes of great Star Trek. Agreed. Oh, um, wait, 725 episodes, 10 movies. Yes. The Ginger Menace says, Jill, wish I could stay, but I have to go to my cardiologist for the results of my heart monitor I wore from two weeks ago. I'm in so much pain. I can't get the spine shots on a blood thinner. It sucks. I'm sorry, Ginger Menace. I hope you yeah, feel better. I, yeah, I'm really sorry, Ginger Menace. Yes, please feel yeah, better I, soon. Take care of there. And, uh, oh, Gary Ambrosia was just here, and Stream Element Spot wants you to remember to check out Bunny Ambrosia's Bunny Rescue, and she does really great work helping the bunnies over there. And um, Ginger Menace says, hopefully they don't make me have another echocardiogram. I think this heart monitor can pick up a fib. I'm happy. And let's see. Gorilla's Random Thought says, I have to get back to work, but I'll be lurking. If you guys want to see LDG flip out, we are watching Matrix 4 on Sunday night. Uh -huh. So, yeah, go check out LDG and Gorilla. <laughs> Watch must, a terrible movie. <laughs> it it must be an alternate timeline. I'm only aware of three Matrix movies. I know. I'm only aware of one. We're we're in way different <laughs> realities. We're phasing. Mm -hmm. And Ravenscroft eighty two says, "I think modern audience forget." Audiences forget how little roles Ahura, Sulu, and Chekhov really had. And that's why every time I see them have anything at all, I get excited. Well, and it's a fun game to play when you actually see the original crew all together in one episode. Like when you get Sulu, Chekhov, Uhura, Scotty, Kirk, Spock, and McCoy. It's fantastic. Yeah, there's, in fact, there's, because there's obviously there's episodes where they don't show up at all. So it's great to see them all together. Absolutely. And as you know. And I wanted to say hi to Herc Lemon and uh, Euler Greg. Oh, hello to Herc Lemon and Euler Greg. Good to see you all. And 
So one of the things I really love about this episode is all of the elements of humor throughout. Brilliantly played by Shatner and Nimoy and written. Well, we know that most of the humor probably comes from Gene L. Kuhn. And it's it's really great. I'm curious about the explanation of Spock, whether or not that jives with mm -hmm. modern sensibilities. But I'm not terribly bothered by it, but I'm just curious what anybody else thinks. Oh, well, Spock needs to cover his ears and they need clothes to fit the time period in general. Now, if they'd known that they had to time travel, they would have brought clothes with them from the ship or called the ship. But they're stranded and all alone with no support. So they have to they have to steal clothes because they don't have and, money. Right. And of course, everything fits perfectly. Of course. And here we have the same alley from Miri. Oh, uh, cool. Is this uh, the last the time? Return of is the Archons, not Miri. Well, probably both, but this is in yeah, Miri. Sense. This is where Spock and they were pebbled with rocks. Oh, that's true, too. I heard this is the last time they used the back lot. Is this true? Oh, that I'm not sure of. Yeah, I, I don't recall. I just heard that, and I, I, I was in a fury this morning listening to stuff. Obviously, a lot of the set was from the Andy Griffith show. Well, I mean, there's a big Me one very. coming up. There's a big yeah. one coming up. Yes. So, so it's fun. Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, sorry. Go ahead, Jill. Oh. Well, it's just fun to see Kirk and Spock do things that they usually would never do. It's the novelty is great fun. And this whole scene is marvelous. So I won't recite the entire exchange or anything. You guys. But I, I can tell you, Ellison hated the rice picker line. But that's yes. the line that I that I picked to share. I love <laughs> that one. Well, yeah, Ellison hated it, but oh well. That's the one he hated. That's he the best did, yeah. part. And does does Spock look obviously Chinese? No. <laughs> okay. He just picked a he just picked a random nationality. He's from South I think America. Right, I think he's hoping that the police officer really doesn't know the difference. Right. Right. Um, well, I will have one of you guys read this in the chat. Pop culture, you want to take it? Uh, okay. Kirk, the unfortunate accident he had as a child, he caught his head in a mechanical rice picker but fortunately there was an american missionary living close by who was actually a skilled plastic surgeon in civilian life <laughs> and like right like somebody but now remember now this is supposed to take place at a time before plastic surgery was invented so i'm sure that police officer would have been confused all around really this is before plastic plastic surgery didn't exist not point? yet Wow. Okay. Well, that, I didn't even realize that. So this predicts plastic surgery. That's that's well, pretty cool. Plastic surgery was around during Star Trek era, but not during the 1920s and 30s. Oh, right. Okay. That makes more sense. Yes. Okay. And <laughs> I, I misunderstood you there. I'm sorry. I was thinking production. Hmm. But the whole thing is is hilarious, and the, and it leads them to the twenty first the twenty first oh. Street Mission Cellar. Um, right after Spock neck neck pinches the police officer right in front of everybody. Who does nothing about it? This must there's be San a, Francisco. There's a uh, the from from the Royal Center of Plastic Surgery. <laughs> Uh, the most significant improvements in the field of plastic surgery occurred during the First World War, when reconstructive surgery was a necessity for the casualties of war. So it may still have been around. Oh, you think it was around before 1930? It may not have been referred to as plastic surgery, but it does. There, they say that the most, uh, the, the earliest um, signs of reconstructive surgery were in. Uh, much, much earlier than the. You're right. Century. It wasn't right. It wasn't necessarily plastic because plastic came about during World War II, if I remember right, when World the Allies couldn't get their hands, or one of the wars where the Allies couldn't get their hands on rubber. So the plastic was invented, I think, as an accident. 
But what I'm looking at is they didn't, they've done reconstructive surgery all the way back to 800 BC in India, which is they were using different materials over the time, over the ages. I'm curious. Though, I wonder true. how much plastic is actually involved. Because even with a facelift, that's considered plastic surgery, but there's no plastics involved. And apparently the 1970s began with, is when the, the plastic surgeons really moved to the forefront. The word plastic itself would be sort of anachronistic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. That's pretty cool. That's pretty cool thought. Um, yeah, I like le learning the, the history of that kind of thing. I do know that they used to use hemp would make good plastic too. Right? Didn't didn't Ford make a car out of uh, plastic that he made from hemp? When was that? I don't know. Let me see. Uh -huh. uh, yeah, I haven't heard that. That that's that's my knowledge of plastic history. So Kirk says, you were actually enjoying my predicament back there. At times, you seem quite human. And Jill, you're right. The soybean car, it was titled, it was actually a plastic bodied car unveiled by Henry Ford on August 13, 1941. 1941. Oh, right. That's cool. And Spock says, Captain, I hardly believe that insults are within your prerogative. As my commanding officer. And um, Spock is becoming frustrated because he has all of these images on his tricorder, but no way to tie them in with the ship's computer. So Kirk uh, suggests that Spock build a computer. And he says, in this zinc plated vacuum tubed culture, and then they meet Edith, and Kirk is completely truthful as to how they ended up there. He confesses to stealing the clothes due to not having any money, and she hires them to do work. Spock takes this as an opportunity to earn enough money to build a computer. But, um, of course, the script writes all of this very humorously, and I adore it so much that I'm not reading it. <laughs> you, you have to go and watch it. <laughs> what? What I will do is read about the character of Edith from Star Trek 365, page 143. And I need to grab the book. I did want to I did want to appreciate James Caserta's uh, shout out to Galaxy Quest. Galaxy Quest in the chat. Why don't we build some sort of rudimentary lathe? I did, yeah. It, it's a rock. It doesn't have any vulnerable spots. <laughs> nice. Thank you, Scotty. And the book has a quote from Edith Keeler. One day soon, man is going to be able to harness incredible energies, maybe even the atom, energies that could ultimately hurl us to other worlds in some sort of spaceship. Edith Keeler. The character of Edith Keeler was loosely based on real life 20th century evangelist Amy Semple McPherson, who preached conservative gospel in progressive ways via radio, movies, and stage acts. During the era in which most of the city on the edge of forever takes place, McPherson was instrumental in opening soup kitchens and free clinics for the poor. Healer is a far more secular character than McPherson, preaching the benefits of hard work, sobriety, and love of one's fellow man rather than strict Christianity. She's a forward thinker, unlike McPherson, who spent much of her life rallying the masses to oppose Charles Darwin's theory of evolution. Speculating about man's exploitation of the atom and his future in the stars. Although Kirk clearly believes that Edith is intuitive, Spock scoffs at any suggestion of clairvoyance and categorizes her observation, her observations as mere gifted insight. Whatever she's got, however, she seems to have it in spades. Had McCoy succeeded in saving her life, she would have gone on to influence no less than Franklin Delano Roosevelt 
with her idealistic and pacifistic beliefs. Or she might have made a good detective. Her powers of perception are quite astute, particularly when it comes to Seisner's spot. Healer deems the Vulcan's position in the universe to be at Kirk's side, as if you've always been there and always will. And indeed, Spock would fulfill that prediction in one way or another for much of the next several decades. So that's that's what the book has on Edith and her the inspiration that Pearson had on Edith. But I wanted to ask, uh, Pop Culture Creator, are you okay? I yep, you. I was just stretching a minute ago. Sorry. Okay, I just, to just making sure. Well, okay. Sure <laughs> Thank you. Fine. Oh, my goodness, this episode. Ha. You're gushing. It. You're blushing and gushing. I am. Well, I just love it. I well, can't really talk about it because I love it too much. It's great. And Kirk, Kirk is obviously immediately enamored by her. And her beauty, you could tell. You know, you're right. Uh, you can look. He he really does look like a man in love several times in this episode. Yes. And it, it, almost like he's not even fake. Like, he's, I know he's acting. And so it's a great performance. But it feels really genuine. What is the rate of pay? Yes, I do love that line. Thank you. He needs he needs to do his hobby with the radio tubes. And so for for ten hours of work at a uh, dollar fifty an hour. Yeah, that's it, great. No, it's fifteen cents an hour. Fifteen cents an hour comes out to be yes. a about a, well it comes up to be a dollar fifty right and that would have been about twenty one dollars in 1930 for 10 hours of work and nice i think it's great said designers actually finding all those old vacuum tubes to put together i thought it was fantastic oh yes definitely so kirk and spock are given bowls of soup and bread to eat and they listen to edith edith's edith speech which is quite lovely and prophetic and I will read her speech. Oh, because, the days worth living for. Because that is how you pay for your soup. You have to listen to Edith. You know, if she really wanted to help a fella out. <laughs> hey, I want to. I want to hear what she has to say. Yeah, but what I'm. I like that. Shut up. Shut up. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> Shut up. Now let's start by getting one thing straight. I'm no do-gooder. If you're a bum, you can't break off the booze or whatever it is that makes you a bad risk. Then get out. Now, I don't pretend to tell you how to find happiness and love when every day is just a struggle to survive. But I do insist that you do survive because the days and the years ahead are worth living for. One day soon, Man is going to be able to harness incredible energies, maybe even the atom. Energies that could ultimately hurl us to other worlds in some sort of spaceship. And the men that reach out into space will be able to find ways to feed the hungry millions of the world and to cure their diseases. They will be able to find a way to give each man hope and a common future. And those are the days worth living for. Our deserts will bloom. And I wanted to add that the homeless guy sitting next to Kirk, a, an original story, in Ellison's original story, it was supposed to be a vagrant called Trooper, who reveals himself to be a veteran of the Battle of the Somme. This character was renamed Rodent and has a smaller role as the bum who incinerates himself from McCoy's phaser. And that scene where he incinerates himself was apparently cut out during some of the syndication runs. They thought it was too violent. Oh, wow, really? They thought it was too violent? And yeah. it was, it's kind of shocking to see that. 
he he grabs the the phaser and he's fiddling with it and not knowing what he's with, doing. Yeah. yeah, he he. Now remember, this is before he was on the episode piece of the action. Yes, mother, mother, right. But it also it, it's also a, a callback to assignment Earth. No, not assignment Earth. Uh, tomorrow is yesterday when Kirk is uh, captured and the uh, base officers are tossing around the phaser and Kirk is like, "Oh no, don't no." Not literally doing that, but in his uh, in his responses. So phasers, yeah, if mishandled, very dangerous. Yes, they are. Be careful with those. It's not a toy. Watch for your pointing. <laughs> Captain Finity says Jill is right, of course. Only one Matrix movie. And hello to Admiral Teague. Good day, Teague. Hello there. Um, Herc130 says it's good to be the boss, but I still have a corporate of overlord. Dang CEOs, says Kurt. And Lemon Pie says, thank you, Scotty. Hi, Scotty. Lemon. And I guess at some point, William Shatner recalled that he attempted to talk to Harlan Ellison during the writing dispute to try and calm things down. According to Shatner, Ellison responded by yelling at him. Oh, my goodness. There's just no reasoning, I guess. <laughs> yeah, that sounds that sounds like what I've been hearing about him. It, it all it's all a very interesting drama though. Well he was upset, yeah, but as soon as they started touching his story, there was just no changing that, I guess. Well, yeah, but if you're gonna write for TV, you're gonna have to expect to have uh, some changes when it doesn't match. Right, it's either the, they the throw TV your shows. script out altogether, they which they consider doing it. So he was lucky that it right. was used. Yeah, exactly. And he got awards for it. So I'm sure he was yeah. happy about the money and the, uh. the Awards. I don't know yeah. how much money he got. That's what Cardinal Sin's question was. And yeah, Captain yeah, it didn't show here, but I'm sure I don't. Mm -hmm. It did not mention if he was paid more than the other writers. So I'm sure I, that's why I'm guessing he was probably paid scale, whatever that was at the time. Mm -hmm. I did try to find it, and I'm not able to at this point. If anybody in the chat knows, you feel free to chime in. Yes, please. Captain Finity says, like, there's only one timeline in 12 Monkeys. Right, because it's uh, a closed loop. And there is one. I don't even remember how many monkeys were in 12 Monkeys. I believe there were 12. There were 12 of them? Okay. I haven't seen the movie. Neither have I. No, but I have. We should, we should watch it at some point. We should, in honor of Mr. Willis. Mm -hmm. Darius Munchausen says, Jill only remembers one Matrix movie. That's fair. Matrix 4 is the one for which LDG infamously got a refund from the theater. Yes, but the time he'll never get back. Right. He was still there. You, you know what? I got, a, I got a refund on Matrix 4 too, but I didn't actually go. So I didn't actually sit there. I didn't actually go to see the movie. So it, it's different for me. Mm -hmm. I just didn't go. Ravenscroft82 says, uh, I ended up watching it on streaming instead. And Ravenscroft82 says, the Guardian always seems so lonely. And I agree with Euler Greg, the humor is played perfectly. That's what makes this episode so much fun to watch is how funny it is. Yes. The levity and the weight, really. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The, yeah. And then, right. And then it hits you with the stakes. And Herc 130 says he saw Sean Carter on Ricada. Oh, the, right. That's a lawyer show. Cool. Yeah. A YouTube channel. Nice. And Stream Elements wants you to remember to subscribe to Gorilla's Random Thoughts. Yes. 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 <laughs> what was Kirk supposed to say? He's obviously from Mars. <laughs> Hello, <laughs> Mr. Officer. Trying... This, yeah, this man is clearly Vulcan. You dummy. <laughs> <laughs> all right. All right. You and your Martian can get up against the wall. Well, there is a bulk in Canada. Oh, that's true. Oh, that would have been even better. This man is clearly Canadian. 
Oyelu Greg says, um, this was a fear of rice picking devices instilled within a generation of kids. See, I'm going to look up mechanical rice picker. <laughs> when were they invented? Hello to Disney Sheep Herder. Hey. Um, Sean Carter says he doesn't remember he was listening to Clobby after work. Oh, yeah. Clobby had a show last night, too. Um, comics Monday night. Mark C's comic. And Sean Carter says, came home listening to Clobbering Times, then filmed the intro to my next build series, the Enterprise C. Cool. Very That's, cool. Right? Can't wait to see that. <laughs> he said that. I still don't like, or I still don't hate Picard season three because, you know, you haven't gone through the horror of watching it so good for you oh. <laughs> <laughs> um if you want to hear me talk about that that's on the phantasmagorium show uh scotty r 37s channel yeah krona says but for me it's not Star Trek. krona says i never used alexa Oh, also, make sure to subscribe to Captain Finity. He he talks about this episode quite a bit sometimes, about the time travel aspect of it. Um, you won't get you won't get as much about it here today. So for more on the multiple timelines in this episode, subscribe to his channel. And Ravencroft82 says, taking today off, trying to recover from a nasty bout. Of the virus of unspecified origin. Nice way to pass the time. Sorry to hear that. Take care. Hope you get better soon. Yes, please get well soon. The mechanical rice picker wasn't even invented until 1965. Mm. Wow. Anyway. Yeah. Well, it makes sense that Kirk is off on his, with what history has passed. I at know. At which I'm point. But I like that. I like that. Thank you. Yeah. No, I just, I didn't know about the plastic hemp car. So I'm just looking stuff up. <laughs> well, yeah, there are some things that are out of order in this episode. It's fine. Again, they're fish out of water. So it's, it's humorous for the story. It is. Captain Finity says, Marty, did you interact with anyone? Oh, yeah. In reference to the uh, chaos theory, it doesn't matter. Or it does matter. Everything matters. John Skodo says, Galaxy Quest is the best Star Trek that isn't Star Trek, but that everyone knows really is Star Trek. Yes. I agree. adore it. Stolen from Honest Trailers. Well, and there's a tea time that we did about Galaxy Quest. There is. That's funny. Hmm. Oh, yeah. And uh, let's see. Oiler Greg says Pearl Harbor would have cured Americans' pacifism. Well, that's a that's an argument that Edith Keeler didn't have to die. But, but uh, well, as as things passed with with her pacifism, Germany won. So that's the contention of the episode. Kronos, interesting question. With enough energy, can we time travel? That's oh. a good question. With energy, enough imagination? Yeah, with imagination, you can time travel. Well, yeah. I just take a but, time machine that's called a book. You can go forward in time or backwards. Take a look. It's in a book. A reading rainbow. I can go anywhere. Butterfly in the sky. Never mind. Fly twice. <laughs> Welcome. You can hear all about it next week on our podcast about reading Rainbow. Yeah. Um, actually just sit around and read. <laughs> scientifically, time travel to the past is impossible, as far as we know. I just Have think I, if there were, if time travel were possible, wouldn't we see the time travelers? Like, yes. Wouldn't we have encountered them? That's my thing. Right. But not really, if you believe in the way that time travel works. Um, that if you go back into the past, you create a new timeline. 
Got it. Yeah. Well, and you wouldn't know that it would have happened. Yeah, you but wouldn't we, know you're as, in... right. Us as observers, we wouldn't know that it happened. Mm -hmm. Right. You would. Know. You would know you're time traveling, <laughs> but but well, but uh... I'm not going to dispute whatever Captain says. Right. Well. <laughs> well, of course. Right. Me too, actually. <laughs> well. In terms of the manipulation of fiction, I'm pretty sure that something that isn't real, you can do whatever you want, as long as it is uh, maintained within the self-contained rules of the story that you're trying to tell. And I, and I like the logic of being able to go back in time, but not being able to erase your past. Grandfather and paradox. So, right. Which not having to done. do. Exactly. It, it's much cleaner that way. Well, and I think in the movie Time Cop, starring Jean-Claude Van Damme, they established that you can't go to the future because it hasn't been, it, ha it hasn't been yet. But there are cosmological uh, suggestions of uh, the nature of time that it's already just, it's a block. It's been, uh, it's been set and we are just uh, going through the inevitability of the motions that the universe started at the Big Bang. Well, I, I believe you can change your fate if you, you know, I don't think it's, Set ah, like the that. Terminator philosophy. Yeah. Um, well, because it hasn't been written yet. No fate, but what we make for ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and you can travel into the future, um, but it requires a spaceship that goes near the speed of light, so you can travel and uh, suffer the effects of relativity, um, time dilation. And that is possible in physics. Time travel to the future. Poopas. Hi, Snorta Poopas Cuber. But Cavatino Calver Calverman says, pardon my interruption, Jill. Do you recognize the meaning of the numbers one, four, three? Um, I do not. No, me I neither. I am sorry. Yeah, maybe if you gave us a clue, Calverman. But I do want you to remember to subscribe to King Dawson TV and yeah. also Scotty R 37s Fantastic Crime Show, where yeah, they're gonna. Oh yeah, later today you gotta read. Uh, you gotta watch Batman. Uh, tonight, uh, the Fantastic Crime Show is doing the long. Or, yeah, the long Halloween. I unfortunately won't be able to make it tonight, but it will be Kat and Ernesto discussing the two-part adaptation and the original graphic novel. Oh, right. Okay, cool. Thank you. Thank you for that update. Mm. Only 30 years until Star Trek comes out on TV. That's worth living for, says Euler Greg. Good answer, Greg. <laughs> oh, right. Oh, okay, I could I should have used put that in Edith Keeler's speech. Someday, television will be in color. What's television, you ask? Anyway. <laughs> and hello to Captain Fandom Nerd. Hello hey, there, Fandom Nerd. Who Curtis will be likes... titillating later on today. Wait, no, that's uh, that's oh. the Comic Relief Crusader. Either way, I'm sure that the uh, Captain <laughs> Fandom Nerd is going to be titillating in his own way. You you never know when he's going to titillate though. You don't know. It's a surprise every time. He, it, it's always a surprise. <laughs> he's not on a schedule. And Darius Munchausen says film and TV are a highly collaborative art form. Writers are only gods of their own novels. The showrunner is god of the series. I yes, agree. they had the final say. And just in terms of the ego and the notability of Harlan Ellison, yeah, I can see why he would be like, well, you wanted Ellison, you're getting Ellison. Don't change my words. You asked for them. Here they are. Mm -hmm. And uh, oh, Euler Gregg says, I like to think drugged out McCoy split infinitely between dimensions and drops regular regularly into various mm. timelines interesting and hello to oh go ahead oh no hello to tony hey tony hello tony good to see hey, you hey hey tony also remember to subscribe to mark dfc yeah some like, great stuff 
I yeah, he like got a idea. new short out of this cool Batmobile retro. You guys should check it out. Cool. Oh, yeah, I did see that. Um, and no, I just like the idea of multiple timelines, mul multiple universes, and all of a sudden you're walking down the street and McCoy jumps out of thin air and starts screaming about murderers and assassins. It's like, holy <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah. Hey. Oila Greg says, Kirk... Kirk's odd views on 20th century history is confirmed in Star Trek 4. Oh, yes. I love That's my favorite movie. Mm -hmm. John Skoto says, are you saying it wasn't really McCoy who altered the timeline, but rather Kirk by mentioning the mechanical rice picker ahead of time? <laughs> How do you know he didn't invent the bloody thing? Um, Darius Munchausen says, theoretically, it would take infinite energy to accelerate anything with mass to the speed of light. But if there was another way, maybe. Yes. Yes, and I was I was thinking theoretically. I realized that we can't actually do that. It's true. We cannot travel on a beam of light yet. How do I know you wouldn't turn it off halfway through? <laughs> Captain Finity says, exploring time travel just got a thousand times easier. Thanks to Clobby. Thank you, Clobby. I exist, but then I never existed. It's, you you had to have you had to have been there for the Deep Space Nine movie on Saturday. It was it was hilarious. Captain Finity says, "If Edith had lived, Kirk would not have disappeared." And uh, well, yeah, the multiple timelines. That is true. Uh, Tony says, I had a full house on Saturday. I'll be at the con this Saturday, too. Oh, awesome. You're right. You're going to Comic-Con. That's going to be fun. Wow, that sounds like fun. Sean Carter says, the theory of relativity. Time seems to pass more slowly when you're with your relatives. <laughs> True story, Sean. Thank you. I'm glad I'm not the only one. Um, Franco Walker says, what if you go back in time and bring someone back to your present? They have traveled into the future. And I'm going to get back to the episode for a little bit because I am really, really behind in my episode. But since he should be on the panel, I will be, but he, his internet isn't working. I'm going to read Captain Finity. Okay. Um, Captain Finity says, inevitably, the moment Jill's show is over, I'll be going live to answer time travel questions. Yes, that's exciting. We're going to have a follow-up live stream with Captain Finity talking about his time travel. And I know it's not his time travel, but you know, he, he talks about it. So Captain Finity says, good question, Franco. Fortunately, time travel to the future always keeps the same timeline. Even Back to the Future follows this. And then Captain Finity says, Scotty's subtle comment about the time travel time travel time traveler inventing the bloody thing is an aspect of closed loop stories like Twelve Monkeys and Terminator One. And it was actually a reference to Star Trek Four when Scotty and McCoy give the formula for transparent aluminum. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, so Edith and uh, Kirk and Edith, they find each other uncommon. Edith helps them find a place to sleep. Flop. And it becomes a room in which Spock builds his computer. And it's a it's a complicated contraption complete with static electricity running between two vertical wires. And Kirk arrives with the groceries. And Kirk says, "No, I just like I like the the matter of fact that Kirk delivers, and he's like, yeah. right, read it for me.' Various vet. Oh, you have the the line read. Okay, cool, 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 cool. Uh, Mr. Spock, I have brought you uh, some assorted vegetables, uh, bologna and a hard roll for myself, and I've spent the other nine tenths of our combined salaries for the last three days on filling this order for you." Mr. Spock, this bag does not contain platinum, silver, or gold, nor is it likely to in the near future. 
Captain, you're asking me to work with equipment which hardly very very far ahead of stone knives and bearskins. So Spock says that he'll need a few weeks to create the first mnemonic memory circuits. So I'm not even sure how long they are there because sometimes it feels like a month, sometimes a few days. Um, I didn't have time to figure out how this out exactly. But Star Trek's always very strange with how it presents the passage of time. Yeah, I don't think they explicitly say how long they're there. Because at first he says, hopefully I can get there within a month or be or within a week. So it could be a month, week, a few days. I, I have no idea. I'd like to think that it takes over uh, a longer period of time simply because I don't, despite modern estimation of James T. Kirk, I don't think he falls in love at the drop of a hat. Hmm. So he has to work closely with Edith. Like, I know he's enamored and there is that sort of meet cute that happens in the basement. But I think that it is basically the the relationship that blossoms, not necessarily, hey, there's Edith. I'm in love. Four days later, she did. So you think it's a little longer to I think build yeah. up that relationship? Yeah, 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 sure, sure. Because they do, because they do have a few scenes where they try to show that relationship blossoming, but they can't. They obviously don't have very long in their fifty minutes to really build that up. So you have to imagine uh, time passage. I agree. So Oops. Edith comes in offering some work. She can get them twenty-two cents an hour. Oh, right, instead of fifteen cents. But then she sees the machine and says, what on earth is that? And Spock says, I am endeavoring, ma'am, to construct a mnemonic memory circuit using stone knives and bearskin. And Kirk and Spock are going to go sweep the floor. With the chair, chair stacked on tables, and there's two men there repairing a clock. And Spock makes note that they have tools that can help him with his computer. So later he breaks into a tool chest that has a combination lock. And Edith catches them and only lets them borrow the tools. If Kirk will t uh, take talk to her and answer her questions, and she believes that they don't belong there. And when Spock asks where they belong, she says, you? at his side, as if you, you've you always been there and always will. And you, you belong in another place. I don't know where or how. I'll figure it out eventually. And so they, and so Kirk and Edith take a walk. She wants to help, and Kirk alludes to the future and the stars. And we see the Brooklyn Bridge, and we hear "Good Night, Sweetheart" on the radio, repair shop. And here I'll read about the music from this episode. Yay! The three sixty five book. I was wondering about this song. Yeah. So, the the score for "City on the City on the Edge of Forever" was written by Fred Steiner. Although Steiner contributed more scores to Star Trek than any of the show's other composers, his best-known television-related work is a cool jazz piece called Park Avenue Beat, which was used as the theme to Perry Mason for that show's entire nine-year run. Ooh. Like many television shows of the era, Star Trek was economical in its use and reuse of its scores. Steiner's score for City was a partial one, with many of the musical cues pulled from earlier episodes. Steiner's original work in the episode underscores the bittersweet romantic relationship between Kirk and Edith Keeler, the old classic Good Night Sweetheart by composer Ray Noble and lyricist Jimmy Campbell and Reg Connolly plays a prominent role in the episode, initially heard playing on a radio as Kirk and Keeler stand talking about the stars, and later 
as a lamentful string adaptation that underscores Kirk's emotions in the aftermath of Keeler's death. A grace note, can there be time travel without anachronism? Apparently not. The scenes on Earth supposedly take place in 1930, but the song Good Night, Sweetheart was not released until 1931. Ooh. Oh, oh dear. Very Sorry. Cool. And the phone telephone came out ringers. even earlier. Yeah, but electric right. telephone ringer, ringers, they were, they were later. It was typically a bell. Anyway. Mechanical, yes. Oh, heavens. But I do like this song greatly. And I do like the, the romance as it blossoms when, uh, when Kirk is uh, sort of explaining the novel uh, that is built around the theme of the word, the three words, let me help, are, uh, are more important than I love you, uh, or at least can be. I thought that that was a, uh, a lovely sort of bit of writing. I'm, very cool. Yeah, very happy with that. I agree. Because it's it's productive. Well, and yeah, and in terms of in terms, of <laughs> let me help is a contribution to your lover, whereas I love you is more of an assertion of the importance of you in the love, which is right. I like that. Right. Want, wanting to wanting to help shows you care. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like that a lot. Me too. And using the clockmender's tools, Spock gets an image of on his tricorder screen of a newspaper report. Edith Keeler, social worker from 21st Century Street Mission, was killed today, it says. 21st, not 21st Century, I don't think. Oh, 21st Street Mission. Sorry. Um, I'll, I'll say <laughs> that again. Edith, Edith Keeler, social worker from 21st Street Mission, was killed today, it says. And yeah, there's there's your vacuum tubes and everything. Yeah, what's great is when they put that together with the vacuum tubes. It, they said basically just used a bunch of vacuum tubes and some blinking lights, but they said they had a blast destroying it. It's always fun to destroy what you put together. Yeah, and they do. They do destroy it right here. Yes. Kirk enters, and Spock says he's found the focal point in time, as the episode says. Or, if you will, the point in which the timelines diverge. And one timeline, you have a potential future um, where it says February 23rd, 1936, six years from now. Uh, reading below the headline, FDR confirms with Slum Area Angel. The president and Edith Keeler confirmed for some time today. So the president and Edith Keeler get together. Uh, to to talk about peacefulness, I guess. But they can't read any further as the whole thing, the whole contraption bursts into flames. There it goes. There it goes. Yay, and, fun. And that was supposedly fun for the production crew. Yes. <laughs> Then um, Spock explains what happens in the second timeline, the original one, timeline A from which they came, in which Edith Keeler dies in a traffic accident. And what they end up doing in this episode ensures that the timeline follows that path and leads to the creation of the Federation. Because if Edith lives and works with the president, Germany will win the war and humanity's future in space is... E uh, either nixed or delayed they need to find McCoy to remove him as the random element that can change the path of history yes that's true so and this is the moment of the episode where we shift to see what McCoy's up to and so so they're trying to figure out whether or not he, he Edith Keeler is meant to die. Mm 
<laughs> well, and we still have to ascertain as to which one is the proper outcome. Well, it's funny too. He says, get this thing fixed. And it's like, my goodness, everything just blew up. How long would it take to replace all those parts? <laughs> I'm not Scotty. <laughs> right. Right. He's the science officer, but he, he's pretty good at building computers. And the man from the, okay, so the man from earlier, like you said, okay, so he steals a bottle of milk from the doorstep. And McCoy leaps in, leaps through a window, and starts shouting. Tripping. Yes. yes, he is tripping. McCoy is still ranting about murderers, asking the guy who spilled his milk not to run. And I know I always trust a raving lunatic not to kill me just because he says he won't. I know. Don't move. <laughs> Stay right there. I'll be right there. I'll be right over there. I'm not going to kill you. No. <laughs> Don't run. Don't Especially run. Especially that look Don't on his face, it. right? And that's how I met your mother. Yes. And Kirk and Edith talk, and she's um, perceiving that one day man will reach the moon and use resources for life instead of war and death. I guess this is our subplot. And then we get the most amazing McCoy scene ever. This was apparently Gary Ambrosia's favorite scene. I love the scene too. McCoy's acting on the car scene is incredible. He doesn't realize he's traveled in time and he thinks he's practically in a museum. I wish I could actually play the video of this whole thing, but I would get stricken for it. So I need someone to read it out for us. Who wants to be McCoy on Cordrazine? <laughs> McCoy on Cordrazine. I think that's uh, Scotty. Okay. <laughs> Biped, small, good cranial development, no doubt considerable human ancestry. Is that how you were able to fake all of this? Very good. Modern museum perfection, right down to the cement beams. Very, very good. Oh, I'd love to, oh, I'd give a lot to see the hospital. Probably needles and sutures, all the pain. They used to hand cut and sew people like garments, needles, and sutures. Oh, the terrible pain. Then he passes out. <laughs> yes. And rolls over. McCoy passes out. <laughs> Thank you. I was trying not to revisit my cortisone overdose, but that was that was therapeutic. I appreciate it. Right, I'm guessing him passing out is his body coming off of the drug. This is where it's starting to wear off. Yes, yes, that was that's incredible. Uh, that was an incredible performance, Scotty. Thank you. I mean, oh, course, it was no DeForest. Of course, it, of course, it comes nowhere near to DeForest Kelly. No, but, it was a poor approximation. <laughs> but I, I enjoyed it. But you're right. His color, the color. Uh, you're right, pop culture. The color is starting to improve, just barely, and but. Of course, he's passed out. The man frisks him, finds his phaser, and runs off a little way. And deletes yeah. himself. Nice manicured fingernails for a homeless guy, but I'll, I'll accept it. Oh, I didn't even pay attention to that. That's a good point. Yeah, that's pretty clean and look, looking really trimmed. Well, when you're homeless, what do you have better to do than... <laughs> Nothing better to do, right. Yeah. Yeah, that's one of his hobbies, uh -huh. keeping his nails nice. All right. He's like, I, I can't. In I reality, I can't I'm sure. Him. I'm sure in reality, it was a different actor doing this close-up shot. That wasn't even in the guy's hands. I bet it looks like a younger person. And this is the scene that was deleted from some syndicated runs. Right, he and disintegrates one, himself. And one of the few uh, updated special effects from this episode as well. Aside from obviously the Enterprise ship, right? And I guess that man doesn't have any effect on this feature. Oh, there was a fan theory mm -hmm. that uh, Star Trek doesn't exist in the Star Trek universe because somehow that man is uh, 
either Gene Roddenberry or related to Gene Roddenberry. And so his death erases Star Trek from the Star Trek universe. His death erases the fictional Star Trek from the real Star Trek universe. Exactly. What? That's funny. I remember reading that like ages and ages ago. Okay, so I do want to get through the episode. So sure. Either Edith, Edith Edith helps McCoy and Spock. Um, oh, oh wait. Edith help, helps McCoy and Spock misses seeing him as he helps with the coffee. So that's what happens there. And I guess I skipped over here. Well, there's where Spock, there we get a little bit of a, a hint of the time. Uh, Spock said that he has spent 30 hours working on that thing. Mm -hmm. So more than a day, at least. Yes. Well, you're thinking, well, yeah, I'm thinking a few days at least. Right. I mean, that's allowing for sleep. And remember, uh, Captain Kirk has to earn the money to buy parts gradually. True. Can Jill, can you go back one? Sure. Okay. Is it people sleeping at the doorway? People sleeping at the doorway. And I just wanted to say that this is a fascinating, almost uh, Walmartian um, little haberdashery that we have here because it's a restaurant, a photographer, and a barber shop. All in one. Yep. All in one. <laughs> it's funny. Yeah. It's interesting. The homeless people sleeping in the doorways, it's reminiscent of modern day cities now the big cities san francisco looks just like that now the only thing missing is the feces and needles yeah yeah now they they, they have tents and stuff all over the place i was looking at yeah. all of all of the sides of the streets in this episode and they have carts of vegetables and stuff that people are selling and and right. instead now they have just and they wouldn't have those uh, stands with vegetables because they would people would be coming along and just grabbing them and walking away. So there's no, you know, crime is rampant. Mm -hmm. Back to the soup kitchen. Yeah. The former set and, of my three sons. Oh really? Yep. So Edith helps McCoy and Spock just misses seeing him because he's helping. With him. And back in their flop, Spock says, this is how history went after McCoy changed it. Here in the late 1930s, a growing pacifist movement whose influence delayed the United States entry into the Second World War. While peace negotiations dragged on, Germany had time to complete its heavy water experiment. And Kirk realizes Germany fascism hitler they won the second world war and spock says because all this lets them develop the a-bomb first there's no mistake captain let me run it again edith keeler founder of the peace movement and kirk says but she was right peace was the way and spock says she was right but at the wrong time with the a-bomb and with their B-2 rockets to carry them, Germany captured the world. And they can't pinpoint exactly when she is meant to die so that the Allies can win World War II. But this is the moment we get our big stakes of the episode that have put this episode's, uh, you know, this episode rated very highly. Kirk admits he's fallen in love with Edith Keeler, but in order to save the world and the Federation... She must die. Another example of the needs of the many over the needs of the few still before that becomes official Star Trek ethos. But there's just so many fantastic character moments too in this episode. This is fantastic. I do like this. Yes, and that's what I mean by what I just said. Too. Well, McCoy being in his stupor and sort of coming out of it and being like, I don't even want to know where I am. I'm either unconscious or demented. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's why he doesn't want to ask that question. Mm -hmm. And he says that it looks like Earth in 1920 or 25, and Edith tells him it's 1930. 
Would you care to try for 30? And so we get a, I'm a surgeon, not a psychiatrist. Yes. But I do, I do enjoy if I, uh, I don't mean to disbelieve you. And then McCoy still sort of tripping. And it's like, that's all right, my dear. That's all right. Because I don't believe in you either. And I'm just, yeah. like, yep. <laughs> that sounds right. Get some rest. Um, uh, did you switch microphones, Pop Culture Curator? No. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. It just sounds a little different. Oh, I'll check my connections. I'm sorry about that. Um, you were sounding fantastic, and then now I can hear a lot of background. Interesting. Yeah. Oh, no, I see what happened. All righty, Rue. Well, yeah, I was just saying because he sounded great this whole episode, right? And then, yeah, and then oh, it, absolutely. And then, the, and then it changed. It, yeah. And we are, we are attempting to get a recording device manufactured using stone knives and bearskins. Yes. Yes. Kirk and Edith have another moment after this. This is, this is of course, great. Every, every scene with. It should be okay now. Yes, sir. Yeah, much better. Thank you. And Kirk and Edith have another moment where she stumbles on a step and he catches her when Spock reminds him that they don't know when Edith is meant to die. He says, we're not sure of the facts. Who's to say when the exact time will come? Save her, do as your heart tells you to do, and millions will die who did not die before. It's kind of strange, too. At this point of the episode, Spock kind of becomes the specter of death. And it's like, because he shows up when she almost falls down the uh, the stairs. And it's, yes. he's like, why? You should have just, she could have just died there. This would have been super easy, barely an inconvenience. Yeah, that is very strange for Spock but, to have to take that role. But it does culminate, like in the final scene with Edith, it does culminate, which is kind of, the logic in the heart with Kirk in the middle. Right. Hey, Leonard is up and about. Yeah, he's feeling much better. And I know this is kind of weird, but Star Trek has always had my favorite coffee cups, whether it be the blue styrofoam on the Enterprise or the ones that McCoy is, is holding right here. I just love Star Trek coffee cups. And that goes straight through to like Deep Space Nine, the teacup that Picard uses. Love it. Me too. The glasses. And... and there is someone in the chat who mentioned that Clark Gable was never actually in a movie until 1931. Again. Oh, good well, point. In the original script, they wrote Richard Dix, who was an older actor. But on the set, they decided that most of the audience probably wouldn't remember that name. So that's why they quickly inserted the Gable yes. reference. Oh, interesting. Because movies were still basically, so, they were, well, they were sound at this point, but Richard Dix was a, a silent uh, actor. So they should have just set this episode in 1931. Clark Gable, well, yeah, possible, right. And so Edith, Kirk, and Spock leave the mission together. Spock heads off alone. And Kirk and Edith dodge traffic to cross the street. Kirk realizes Edith has seen McCoy, so he leaves her on one side of the street, asking her to stay while he goes to intercept McCoy. And McCoy comes out and they greet each other, but a truck is coming down the street as Edith starts to cross, not looking. Apparently, a uh, quick note, Gable started yes. in 1923. It's just that by the time this episode took place, he wasn't really that big of, a, of an actor. He was mostly background and extras still at that, some po at that point. Oh, okay. Like he hasn't made, he hadn't had his breakout role yet. Exactly. Thank you. You're welcome. And so McCoy comes out and he dashes forward, but Kirk grabs him and pulls him back on the pavement. Just 
just as Edith and the truck meet. Well, and that's what I mean in terms of the the outburst from both Spock and McCoy. Is Spock says, Jim, no. And McCoy's just, Jim, as in do something. And Jim does something. He grabs him and pulls him back, just as Edith and the truck meet in a squeal of bricks. And apparently there was some uh, uh, hesitance from Gene Roddenberry in uh, Jim not reacting immediately. His hesitation was like, well, how how is the audience supposed to respond to Kirk as being a proactive uh, captain if he has a moment of hesitation here? But I'm glad that they left it in. Yeah, me too. For the emotional but weight. that yeah. You need that hesitation. That yeah. Because you, you, it makes you believe for a moment that he might favor. Oh, um, not Brian. McCoy says you deliberately stopped. Well, yes, not Brian doesn't think he had to die. No, but there, yes, agreed. And McCoy says you deliberately stopped me, Jim. I could have saved her. Do you know what you just did? And Spock says he knows, Doctor. And of course, I'm sure they'll explain why that had that had to happen that way to McCoy. And all Spock says is um, when they get back through the Guardian is we were successful. Time has resumed shape. All is as it was before. Okay, this is the Guardian. Many such journeys are possible. Let me be your gateway. And Ahura says, Captain, the Enterprise is up there. They're asking if we want to beam up. Patty, what does Kirk say? Let's get the hell out of here. And the network had problems with that. They left it in anyway. Yeah. And aside, just to, to sidestep, because it is, it is a uh, absolutely engaging. Uh, time travel story one of my main problems with this episode and i think it's one of the first nitpicks that i ever discovered in uh in the original series is that there are seven people beaming up and only uh six transporter pads good points yeah i guess one of them needs to ride up piggyback huh <laughs> yes ensign brundle <laughs> that is that's pretty good to pick but this is still a very spectacular star trek episode even given the tumultuous way in which it was produced and written and usually when that kind of thing happens a bad episode happens when there's too many people working on it but this this time it worked well And again, one of the most iconic shots from Star Trek as well, in terms of them beaming away from the Guardian. Yep, and another example of great set design. Mm -hmm. I like the runes. Yes. Me too. Runes, and it, ruins. It, it, yeah, no, this, uh, this episode is wonderful. The heart and the imagination in it, in a teleplay like this. Making uh, where Kirk makes the ultimate sacrifice for the world, for the universe, as Captain Kirk. And the whole episode is a beautiful display of that reality. And we know peace is the ultimate goal um, and the goal of Starfleet. But objectively, it's always important because until we get there, we still need to keep up. Uh, and even when we have it. As we see in later Star Trek, we need to build up our defenses against those who will end that possibility for that hopeful future. And now I know in in reality, uh, the multiple timeline aspect of this does does make things a little bit more exciting for this episode, and and does change some of those sentiments that you get from it. But from Kirk and Spock's perspective, this is what had to happen. And for the Enterprise to return to carry on with our future adventures. And the magic of this story it is complete, completely intact, thanks to the Guardian of Forever. 
Well, that adds a little bit of something, something to the uh, the time travel question as well, considering that I would assume that the guardian is sentient. And being yes. the guardian of forever, perhaps there is a laid out timeline. Yes, I, I do get the idea that if this, it can be viewed as multiple timeline, Kirk could have taken Edith back to his future. But the writers of this episode didn't know that idea. They believed it was a malleable timeline and Edith had to die. And so it's, it is it is one of the best Star Trek episodes. And I'd say all the drama in it, all the humor in it, and and even all the drama, the real life drama with Harlan Ellenson and all the introspection into the time travel make it make it one of the best top three at least Star Trek episodes because we'll likely never stop talking about it for generations to come as long as we you know, continue our, to sh- right. share. Yep, it's timeless. Even our children will be talking about it. It's wonderful. I love it. Yes. And and all the best episodes require you to think beyond the episode itself. And this episode definitely qualifies. So it gives an A++ for me. Yeah, I want to share something really quick here, if I can, from this yes. book. Please. Uh, this is by Herb Solo. And this is uh, when Harlan received his award, award for the 67 Writers Guild of America. So it said the dinner was held at La Escafia, the elegant rooftop restaurant at the Beverly Hilton Hotel in Beverly Hills, which, by the way, I stayed a week at, where on this night, black-tied men and beautifully gowned women gathered to celebrate and honor the best of the best. Among these writers nominated, the outstanding script in the television dramatic series was Harlan Ellison for City on the Edge of Forever. Desilu had bought a table for the big event. Sitting happily around it were the two jeans, R.J., my friend and well-known screenwriter. That's R.J. is uh, Robert Dustman. My friend and well-known screenwriter, Howard Rodman, and myself and our wives. We were all excited. There was a chance that a Star Trek script would be singled out for excellence and win the award. We hoped that Star Trek would receive some peer recognition and we all would bathe in the limelight. The time had come. The announcement was made. The award for the most outstanding script for a dramatic television series is City on the Edge of Forever, story and tell play by Harlan Ellison. We were thrilled. We applauded our hero, Harlan, as he rose from his chair at another table and strode to the podium to receive his award and say a few words. Well, perhaps more than a few words. After all, the winner was Harlan. But after Harlan finished saying all the usual nice things about his writer peers and his guild, Failing to mention Star Trek or even recognizing the two genes in RJ, he quickly turned his attention to artistic integrity and as quickly our joy evaporated. Harlan berated the studio executives. He called them suits and the executive producers and producers of television series for interfering with the writing process. I was surprised that Harlan, while he was at it, didn't berate the waiters for clearing tables while a writer was speaking. But the ultimate insult was yet to come. Building to a passionate finale, Harlan suddenly brandished his original script high above his head, shook it in the manner of Napoleon Bonaparte preparing the armies for battle, and declared, Remember, never let them rewrite you. The writer-dominated audience rose to their feet in masks and hailed this living hero who had the guts to publicly speak out against them. And as Harlan walked from the podium, he looked over to our table and defiantly shook his script at us. Surprisingly, Gene Ronberry seemed amused. He turned to us. He shrugged and smiled. So what else is new? I must say, I too was relatively calm as I picked up the two knives lying before me on the table, the dinner knife and the butter knife, and I stared at them. Which one should I use to kill Harlan? I wondered. I decided on the butter knife. It was sort of dull and would cause more pain. <laughs> you learn more. <laughs> So he was um, cantankerous. Who who wrote that account of that speech? Herb Solo. Herb Solo? Okay. Yes. <laughs> yeah, definitely. No mention of groping, but that may have been a d- different award. That was the Hugo. Got it. Mm-hmm. Was this the Hugo or this was the other one? That was the 67 Writers Guild. The Writers Guild one, yeah. Okay. Right, so the room, and that's why the room was also full of mostly writers. Mm-hmm. Yeah, how how dare you make your TV show the way you want to make your TV show? 
All right. Never let them rewrite you. Mm -hmm. that, that's great. Thank you for sharing that. Oh, no, thank you. Appreciate it. And and so it looks like we... Oh, right. Okay, so I gave my review for, for this episode. What... What do you guys think? Go ahead, Scotty. Uh, I, well, I give it an A+. Plus. It's fantastic. Uh, when I was a kid, I didn't really like it because it was all in 1930. And I was, I was watching for, you know, space stuff. But I really appreciated it later on. And this is the episode that really sort of made me fall in love with Dr. McCoy. And uh, there are two episodes that made me fall in love with Dr. McCoy. But this is one of them. And uh, I really enjoy his performance. I like the the character play between uh, Kirk and Spock. I like the love story and some of the introduction of the anachronisms of the novel from the uh, author on the far left star of Orion. And yeah, I there it's really cool. Uh, and I, I just grew into it. And so, yeah, A plus. This is something I almost didn't watch. Uh, for us talking about it today because I've seen it so many time, times and I'm glad I actually did revisit it just because it made me really happy again. So I love this episode a whole bunch. And I'd have to agree. I'm definitely A++. Um, the turmoil, the history behind it, knowing about the rewrites and it brought in a lot of the uh, Star Trek lore. Without this episode, not only would we not have this fantastic episode, but without this story uh, treatment we never would have had mirror mirror which is also considered a fan favorite and as you can see where it says um another thing which kind of reminds me you know and i hate to bring it up again but the similarity with gilligan's island and that is that uh, dr mccoy will finally get his proper treatment in the next season where he his name joins the beginning cr uh, cast and credits along with william shatner and leonard Nimoy. it's too bad he wasn't like that and you know he was basically and the rest but he right. will finally get his his just deserved in the uh, second and third season, which I'm really happy for. Me this too. episode was one episode that really proved that man could carry an entire episode. So I'm really, really happy. No complaints. A lot of ideas that, uh, thrown in here. I know the time travel might be a little wonky, but I love the set design, the idea that um, the Guardian of Forever, and it's, you know, you get a crazy eccentric, eccentric author like Harlan Ellison and even tamed and through four rewrites can still manage to come out with a fantastic episode like this. So yeah, definitely one of my top favorites. Thank you, Jill. You're welcome. And we have a lot of chat, but yeah, we do. Um, Yay. I'm going to read Captain Finity's chats and then I'm going to get to the rest of the chat. So he says, if there's an iota of change, it's, the second timeline it's that simple and yes i do i do like that idea and oh <laughs> okay then captain finity says timeline b also needs to beat and bosh and create the federation dramatic tension maintained and and Captain Finney says, yes, take hot Edith with you. And also, can we have more chats from Not Brian, please? Because I like reading them in his voice. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I, I intend to look at as many chats as I can. It's always nice to see Not Brian. Mm -hmm, it is. And everyone else. Right. And Captain Finney says, we didn't have rockets. That's why we had to deliver the nuclear weapons we did have via propeller air aeroplane. Good point. Oh, okay. So that, that has something to do with something else. Maybe I should be reading everybody's chat to make, make any of this make any sense. <laughs> okay. Let's context let's be that. damn. <laughs> Man, where was I though? There's so much chat that happened while while I was getting through the episode. True. This is the fun part where I try to figure out. Oh, Snorta Poopus, and you said hi to him when you came in. I did say hello to Snorta Poopus. 
You did. Snort of Poopus. Hey. Snort of Poopus says, I have come from the future to tell you that Earth sign overlords have taken over your planet. Things will be much better soon. Can't wait. Oh, thank you. I can't wait. Yeah, me too. So polar bears, ready? get ready for your polar bear overlords. Craig 130 says, all the world is indeed a stage and we are merely players, performers and portrayers, each another's audience outside the gilded cage. And Darius wants you to remember to subscribe to the Phantasmagorium show. Thanks, Darius. And Cronus says that I just read polar bear propaganda. You got to pick a side and I'm on the polar bear side. Cavatino says 143 is the texting code for I love you. Oh, oh okay. So. I is one. Love equals four and you equals three. I'm guessing he means letters in the word. Whoa. Oh, yeah. That, that's a little bit. A little bit loud. Thank you, Darius. I think the gain on your mic might be a little high there, Pop. Turn it down. Sorry about that. That's okay. But yes, indeed. Thank you, Darius, mm -hmm. for... Posting the link to Pop Culture Curator's channel. Lots of fun we're having over there talking about Lost in Space and his horror, horror movies. Things like that. Horror sci fi. Mm -hmm. Tonight's oh, sci fi yeah. comedy. Yeah. Sci fi. Awesome. James Caserta says time is being changed all the time. Oh, and Sean Carter is quoting Clabbering Times from from the last review of The Children of Time. It existed, but it didn't exist. But it existed. And then, look, right here on this pad, we see evidence that they existed, but they never existed. And James Caserta says, I'm imaginary. Sort of poop as Cuber says, Kirk flies a mean broom. Rumors confirmed. He's a witch? Oh, that doesn't come back until uh, all of our yesterdays. He's a witch. Burn him. John Scoto says, interesting dilemma. Kirk and Spock go back to undo what McCoy did. But their very presence may be altering times in ways they cannot know. I uh, can't make an omelet. <laughs> Yeah. Yes, and that. Yeah. Well, no, I was just thinking about the people that uh, Kirk st stole the clothing from, who were housed, probably had a job, couldn't go to work that morning. Who knows? That's true. <laughs> well, also, uh, it's a good thing that Kirk didn't immediately start telling Edith Keeler about the future. He tends to do that in some of these episodes when they have a time. Somebody out of time, like with the uh, all our yesterdays, it was like, oh, by the way, you're in the future and blah, 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 blah. And here's our ship. Let's give you a whole full tour. And so I'm glad that he held back on this episode instead of explaining everything to Edith Keeler. Yeah. And you'd, you'd see how that would be tempting to do so since Edith was so clairvoyant. She was able to see the future. And she sensed couldn't... there was something. Yes. Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah, I'm sorry. So... Did I mean uh, tomorrow's yesterday? I apologize for that. Yeah. So she she had good predictions for the future, but Kirk doesn't confirm them like he like he would normally be tempted to do. Sean Carter says uh, that Kirk says, "I'm afraid I'm in love with Edith Keebler. Those <laughs> cookies." <laughs> are just irresistible. <laughs> Jim, Edith Keebler is an elf that lives in a tree. Her cookies must be eaten. Stark of Iron says, time travel to the future by default is a skip forward on the same timeline because we are already time traveling to the future at the speed of reg uh, 
regular relative time. So just hit the gas. And Captain Infinity says, aha, so Star Trek Four is closed loop, but City is multiple timelines. You cannot change the laws of physics, Roddenberry. <laughs> it's all Roddenberry's fault. <laughs> yeah. Well, he inspired the show. Everybody, everybody worked around. He made it. <laughs> I'm reminded of Dustin Hoffman reciting Who's on First from Rain Man. Edge of Time says, that's called stretchy time. Why did the last 10 minutes of a school day feel like forever? Stretchy time. Makes sense, Edge of Time. You are right, on the edge of it. And because you were staring at the clock. <laughs> <laughs> also, Snortapoopus Keeper says, leave the bearskins out of this, Spock. You would have been lucky to get a bearskin. But Snortapoopus, I want to see the battle between the polar and the panda bears. They've got to oh. be casualties. Oh, well, the polar bears are going to win. Of course. Dark of Iron says, I think I have a thesis that can scientifically support divergent timelines for traveling to the past to support the narrative balancing from Finity's discovery. Nice. John Scoto says that James to James Caserta, and Kirk didn't have a psychologist or a counselor sitting on the bridge. Mm -hmm. Had a doctor making warm martinis. And Snortapoopus says, Good night, sweetheart, was written in 1931. It would seem the radio in the shop window was picking up a signal from the future. <laughs> And Snorpoopus says, also Keeler made a reference to Clark Gable, who wouldn't star in a movie until 1931. Edith Keeler was also a time traveler. Oh, but what if what if Clark Gable was the time traveler, just unknown? Well, that's like how they had a guitar that wasn't quite made in the same year um, in Back to the Future. Oh, right, right, later. right. I remember that. It was kind of like that. Ravenscroft82 says, when I was 14, I wrote a Star Trek Lord of the Rings crossover where they used the Guardian to locate an herb that grew only in the Middle Earth age to cure Mr. Spock of a disease. Okay, that sounds like a pretty good story. Mm -hmm. Captain Finity says, I also answered to Pope of Time Travel. James sort of says, else Kirk would have had to kill her. And oh, Captain no. That would have been a dark turn. Yeah, right? No. I'm glad that didn't happen. Captain Just st standing on curbs waiting to push Edith in front of a bus. <laughs> in an alternate timeline, that is actually the origin of the phrase being thrown under the bus. It's a direct reference to Edith Keeler. Not really. I'm making all this I up. I know. No. <laughs> now that's no. Now that's new etymology. You've rewritten etymology, Scotty. You can't take it out. Timeline B. Uh, Captain Finney says timeline B also needs to beat and bosh and create the Federation. Dramatic tension. What planet is this? Says James Caserta. Well, the city on the edge of forever takes place. Earth yeah, I think what he's asking guardian, is right because this obviously wasn't Earth, so I think that's what he's asking is like, well, the they, guardian happens, obviously, the guardian's not on Earth, right? So that it, it, it happens to be covering Earth's time, hmm. so I guess that is something that's kind of but does the really planet mentioned. have a name? Yeah, I don't remember them mentioning it. <laughs> that's a good question. I'm just gonna go double check yesteryear, yeah. You guys, you guys tell me, because you tell me, Scotty. Um. Not Brian says, for the love of God, let Edith on the Enterprise. For the love of Dynasty. Captain Vanity says, Edith B. living wouldn't, couldn't affect or change the existence of the Enterprise in timeline A. 
So yeah, that in, in the context of the episode being multiple timelines, Edith Keeler can live in a different timeline. Ravenscroft82 says, there's such a tragic air of doom hanging over this episode. I never felt Kirk's love was portrayed as com as convincingly as here. It's just perfect. Yep, good chemistry between the two. I agree. Absolutely. Absolutely. Kirk has that, I don't know, he just has that look. That's and I, just... Yeah, and I hate to say a disparaging word, but this is the only role that I think I, I that me personally has ever seen uh, – Joan Collins in that she wasn't a bitch. It's like everything it seemed like other than this, she was the bad guy. I don't know. Oh, really? But I obviously had not seen everything she's done. Well, this is 67. And in 72, she was in the great movie Tales from the Crypt. The first episode where she murdered her husband with a fireplace poker. And then I remember on Dynasty, she was like a cruel um, bad guy there. But obviously she has she had other roles where she was good guys. Yeah, those definitely sound like bad guys. A good guy. <laughs> yes. I want to see that movie, Tales from the Crypt. I used to watch the show. Well, this is the 72 version, so it's a little older, but it's still good. She's in the very first one. And, and the episode, if you've seen the series, Tales from the Crypt, the episode, yes. it was redone. It was one of the first episodes where the Santa, the crazy Santa breaks out of an asylum and he's going around killing people. She's the woman that murders her husband and he happens to come visit. And that one was redone and redirected by, I believe, uh, Robert Zemeckis for the new Tales from the Crypt for HBO. Mm -hmm. All Through the House, I think, might be maybe the name. Right. Something like that. Snurda Poopa says, and the bum who would have sobered up, gone into medical research, and found the cure for cancer in 1940 is erased from history. Mm -hmm. So we have no cure. <laughs> he destroys That's himself. It's an interesting paradox that the doctor is responsible for the person who uh, did not present the cure for cancer. Nice echo. He searches the man. The man searches him. Yeah, that's a good point. It works really well in the scene. We were much better off without him, says James Caserta. Ravenscroft says, I could seriously have gotten into a series where Kirk and Spock just time travel together. God, they had great chemistry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, They're a wonderful team. Kirk 130 says, I once saw a radiator repair shop and beauty salon at the same place. But that's just Texas normal. <laughs> as long as they don't get them confused while you're in there. You want the 32 ounces or the large... Well, that's a lot of coffee. That is a lot of coffee, but I'll take the large. <laughs> um, um, not Brian says the song "Good Night, Sweetheart" is playing when they walk past the store. The song was later used in the UK TV show called "Good Night, Sweetheart," where Rodney Trotter goes back in time and falls in love. Interesting. I'm not familiar, but I will investigate. And Snurda Poopa says, again, poor Hollywood history. Germany was so far off the right track in their nuclear research. It is unlikely they would have ever developed. Not Brian says, you've only gone and created a new timeline, Rodney, you Burke. <laughs> to Captain Kennedy. Captain Kennedy says, although their rocket research was peerless, U.S. citizen." Ship. Herr von Braun? Herr von Braun. In terms of being instrumental in terms of, oh, was it because of the space race? I think. I don't know. You're, you're right. Uh, er, von Braun. Um, I know who, I know, I've heard that name too. There's a, there's a song about it. Hey, Daniel's Hot Topics is here. Ahoy, Daniel. Um, <laughs> hey, uh, Scotty, can you read this for me, please? We have the big missiles. 
but we has not the big boom jamakas. That was by Snort of Poopus Keeper. Thank you. I couldn't have done that. <laughs> Captain Kennedy says we didn't have rocket rockets. That's why we had to deliver nuclear weapons. We did have via propeller aer aeroplane. Now that's now that chat makes sense. <laughs> Where is the rocket? And everybody subscribe to Tony's channel, Stark of Iron. He's just started streaming again last weekend. Yeah, fantastic. Right. Oh, and Blade Runner is here. Wow. Hey, Blade Runner. Hello Ooh, there. That society has slowed down. This was 30 years before it aired. If they did that now, the main difference 30 years ago is no smartphones and no Facebook, but still had Shuttle and Concord. And Blade Runner, please let Captain Infinity know if you're a replicant or not. Yes. Edge of Time says, minus one grade for convenience and contrivance. How did Bones get teleported down? I must have missed it. He karate chopped Kyle. Right, and poor Kyle. Remember the floor? Chop, chop. And he does, Kyle pull, the, on the floor. he does pull the sliders, like the transporter activation. And uh, Well, he does. And they use the those coordinates console. to beam down, right? That's how, they, that's how the planning party beamed down. Is that was the last coordinates that they had been used in the transporter. Cabatino says, at least in the scene where McCoy's in bed, he's not wearing clothing with Calvin Klein written on it. Yes. All oh, right. <laughs> yeah, that's nope. a reference. A reference to Back to the Future. Yes. Damn it, Edith. I'm a Leonard, not a Calvin. Then it's William Tice, not Calvin Klein. Captain Finity says, well, I just realized it took teamwork from scientists on both sides of World War II to give us nuclear weapons and the rockets to deliver them. How nice. Yay, teams. Yay. <laughs> In their <laughs> destructiveness, yes. Tony says, wouldn't it be ironic if the evil federation for Mirror Mirror is a result of Edith's survival? It would be. That'd be interesting. Sort of poop says what they needed was a more accurate way to aim the missiles. They could have delivered a crap ton. <laughs> Use of official scientific units. Crap ton. Yes. Um, <laughs> oh, <laughs> of conventional explosives on strategic targets. Um, Scotty, please read this. Um. No, it's a, it's supposed to be uh, Joan. Oh, wait. Okay. But Jim, couldn't we just, couldn't we put her on the Enterprise instead? No. Joan Collins is too expensive. Oh. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that's the real reason why they didn't right. <laughs> take Joan Collins on the Enterprise to the future. Yes. Yes, Tony. This is the birth of the mirror universe in my head canon. Captain Infinity, and apparently there is a tie between... in the story, right? In the actual story, it was the birth. Well, it was in the. It was a a, a pirate uh, federation, mm -hmm. not necessarily just straight up evil, but a pirate. So they were pillaging the uh, apparently the galaxies rather than helping them. Yeah, I'm running out of time, but I'm going to see how much I can read in five minutes, and then we're no going to close the show. So. Unfortunately, Captain Infinity despises head cannon. Oh, and edge of time about your coffee cup obsession. What about the splayed bottom TNG coffee cup? I, d I thought that was introduced in Deep Space Nine. I thought that's where they got the splayed bottom uh, coffee cup. But if it did originate on TNG, then I stand corrected edge of time. But that is, yeah, I love that coffee cup. <laughs> I do remember it mostly on DS9 too. That's where you got the rack to Gino from the Replomat. Captain Finby says, anyway, this is why I'm transitioning from part-time YouTuber to full-time science fiction author. Outstanding. Snorta Poopus Cuber says, and do, not does Germany win World War II, but she never gets a star in Dynasty. 
James Caserta says, Gary, for a moment, James, but your moment is fading. Hmm. Gary? I don't know. I don't know. I'm confused. Captain Finity says, Jill's point two years ago about method of time travel was ahead of its time. You can yeah. stay, but your friend in the gorilla costume has to leave. Data? That was on the Farpoint mission seven years ago. I know. I just got it. Little generations. Okay. okay. Yeah. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for that moment of data. Absolute ridiculousness. Yes. Into understanding emotions and not being able to control them at all. He goes berserk in that scene. True. Captain Finity says the important difference between the Guardian of Forever and a DeLorean is only the former can bring you back to timeline A. Right, because the Guardian of Forever is sentient and exists in the past, present, and the future. Take care, Tony. See you, Tony. Oh, goodbye, Tony. Mm -hmm. And pardon me for saying it, says Snortapoopus, but we were spared a pompous storyline by Harlan Ellison, one of the most overrated sci-fi writers in history. Books thrown object. I'm sure you're not the only one with that opinion. I I still haven't read the script myself. I've read Harlison's work or Ellison's work. It's it's good. He wrote some really good stories. Captain Infinity says any writer that can't manage dramatic tension for a second timeline is simply a weak writer. Well, th this episode was written as though it's malleable. So that's how I presented it. With the uh, with the thoughts about the multiple timelines, Blade Runner says seven pads if you include the center one. I don't think there is a center pad on the original series. Captain Infinity says Edith had to die for the Federation to be born in timeline B, no less tense. Yeah, exactly. Well, okay, I do agree with that because that's that's what I was saying at the beginning, is that the the Federation is good to have in both timelines. That's where we were going with this. One. But I realized that my presentation of it might be confusing because time travel is also confusing. Not Brian says, even if it's a malleable timeline, the only thing that needs to happen is that is Edith is for her to cease to exist from that point in time. So she could have gone with them to the Enterprise. Yes, agreed. And Finity says, malleable timelines never work, ever. I exist. I don't exist. Impossible nonsense. It doesn't even work in fantasy. And yeah. I can't wait to see what sarcastic gif you have DM'd me, Scotty. Use your words. I am using my words. Malleable timelines is Hollywood fancy talk for quadruple homicide. <laughs> the Federation exists. The Federation doesn't exist. For F's sake. Fact's sake. I'm so pumped. Oh, this is Captain Kennedy. All of those chats were by Captain Kennedy. So wonderful. No wonder why personalities killed Star Trek, says James Caserta. And Captain Kennedy says, listening to Jill talk time travel makes me feel like cocaine beer. Yes, because I was presenting the episode as it was written by the authors of the episode who wrote it as a malleable timeline, even though I understand it now as multiple. And because I want to respect the actual writers of the, the show. Mm -hmm. Malleable timelines are never okay. Really? I hadn't heard. <laughs> I'm not laughing at the idea of that, but just. It's just a lot of fun reading these chats. Have you heard that malleable timelines? Simply ridiculous. Can't Impossible. Impossible. Snortaboop is Cuber says, Welcome to working for other people, Harlan. You sold them the script. Roddenberry was free at that point to rewrite it or use it as toilet paper. 
Oh, but there is a reciprocation that happens because Roddenberry did want Ellison's name on it so that it would attract other uh, science fiction authors. That's true, too. But so, don't be surprised when you're writing a, a episode for a TV show and the TV show wants you to follow some certain rules that Harlan wasn't down with. They did give him the opportunity to rewrite it, but you know, it was nearly still as unfilmable, filmable. And they gave him months, you know, obviously, and it was still unfilmable. So they finally had to take it away from him and work on it themselves. Yeah. Did he really do cartwheels in the hallway? That's yes. what I heard. Among other things, yeah. <laughs> That's kind of funny. Oh, Rancor Steve was in the chat earlier. Go ahead and subscribe to him, too. Oh, he's Steve. Got, yeah, he's got a Thursday show. Nice. Captain Finity says, Light King with the Shining. Suck it, Specky. And Ravenscroft82 says, time travel plot about World War II and Germany's weaponry. Kind of sort of ripped off by Galactica 1980. Yeah, that's not all that show ripped off. And Not Brian says, great stream for a great episode of television, folks. Cheers. I totally agree. Mm-hmm. And... And Blade Runner is glad that Captain Infinity could be here for this iconic time travel episode. And when Captain Infinity sells the rights, he ain't even watching what they do to it. That you know, that's pretty smart because he probably won't like it. Does that include your uh, appearance, and your your likeness? Mm-hmm. Oh, that's a that's a good point. That's a good question. Does that include that? Um. Captain Infinity says to Blade Runner, thank you. Jill was gracious enough to invite me, but New Zealand internet is slow, and my position is generally known. It's true. And we'll find out later on his live stream. Oh, man. I got I gotta go. I think I'm I think I'm done, but there's so much there's still so much chat. I wish I could have somebody um, go get my Go do the things that I have to do. I'm on it. I'll take care of it. <laughs> no. No, it's okay. Um, okay. Well, I offered, so forget it. I know. <laughs> but I don't want to just leave you here. <laughs> and this no, episode no. that Sword of Poofus refers to is on YouTube. You can catch it. It's a few mm-hmm. times you can see the cast smoking cigarettes. Oh, yeah? Yeah, McCoy, uh, DeForest Kelly and Jimmy Doolin are smoking cigarettes. So I thought that was odd. And I, it still stands out when you watch it. It's kind of odd. Mm-hmm. Well, there's still a ton of great chat here, but we've got to go. It's time to go. Uh, <laughs> well, sorry, this one. if you have any suspicions, you're in a dramatic, malleable timeline. Please speak to Scotty R37. I. I have I have no way to confirm nor deny that particular hypothesis. I just thought it was kind of funny. Oh yeah, for sure. Totes. Oh, and Daniel's hot topics this year. He says, "Wouldn't it be cool to see an episode like Trials and Tribulations?" But <laughs> oh no, <laughs> but with Michael Burnham and Stamis, maybe even Culver going back to TOS during. Balance of terror. That sounds like a wet sandwich in a hot car. Daniel, Daniel, Daniel. It's so great to see you, Daniel. It is good to see you, though. <laughs> thank you, uh, Raymond. Yeah, thanks, um, Raymond. Um. Oh, and uh. Okay, so I don't. Oh, okay. Raymond has to go. See, he says, "Take care and thank you." Anti-derivative Jill, pop culture curator, and Scotty are thirty-seven. Cheers. See you tomorrow. Take care. Yeah, looking forward to to your show tomorrow evening. And Captain Infinity says, "Come join me in a world where we have multiple timeline internal logic and pathos for Kirk, Edith." That's a good world. Then uh, Sorta Poopus says the lim- they eliminated the center pad because anyone standing there would have been 
blocking Captain Kirk's key light. But, oh my goodness. And Captain Finity thanks us. A fire in my belly is priceless. And and thank you everybody for uh, joining us for this this just amazing Star Trek episode. Oh, the the uh, poll! I almost forgot it. Let's close that poll. Mm-hmm. So with fifty five votes, wow, that's, that's a lot for me. That's a great turnout. Isn't it? It is. My my high is usually around 40, 55. Wow. Um, what grade do you give City on the Edge of Forever? Most people, 91% give it an A. 7% give it a B. 1% gave it an F or a D. I'm glad that there is one. uh, I'm just kidding. (laughs) Yeah, I know, right? But we appreciate you, honestly. Me too. Yeah, I do too. Like, I'd I'd love to hear from that person too. And so Raymond wants to remind us tomorrow, anti derivative Jill joins King Dolphin for a dramatic reading on Radio King Dolphin TV at this link. Looking forward. And take care, everyone, and much love to you all. You as well, Franco. Much love to you of the body. Joy and tranquility to you. Poopus has it right. I give the episode five out of five quatloos. Agreed. Oh, and I do have... The preview for next week's episode. This will be the season finale for season one of Star Trek, the original series. Rough couple of missions for Kirk. Mm-hmm. And Like, I'd love to hang out and stuff. But yeah, fair go. enough. Let's I get, got stuff to do. Let's get the hell out of here. Yeah, finally, the episode has a good takeout line for me. First, I have to find the trailer. Um, thank you guys for joining me today. Please tell me about your channel. But not me. Uh, you know my channel. I'll do something on Friday. Yeah, what are we doing on Friday? Do you know? Um, oh, wait, it's going to be UFO. UFO. Yeah, yeah, it'll be UFO. Because we missed uh, it last Friday. That's true. Uh, and over on the Phantasmagorium show uh, this evening, uh, the lovely, talented, wonderful, and knowledgeable Cat and Ernesto are going to be discussing the two-part animated adaptation of The Long Halloween by Jeff Loeb and Tim Saleh. Uh, that'll be this evening. And then on this Thursday, we, uh, Jill and I are going to be discussing episode six of Bald Spaceman. And uh, just discussing that and disgusting that uh, as we travel through the 10 episodes that have been foisted upon us this year. Yeah. And. Thank you, Jill. Tonight, we're uh, my horror sci-fi review at 6 p.m. Pacific time. We are covering the 1975 classic Death Race 2000. And on Wednesdays, I usually cover Gilligan's Island, the original series. Mondays, uh, we just started, uh, we premiered just last night our cover of the original Lost in Space series. So we covered the original episode, The Stowaway, the number one. And next Monday will be episode number two, The Derelict. Thank you, Jill. You're welcome. And thank you, guys. Cheers. Thanks. And thank you for for everybody in the chat for being here, giving me the most amazing Star Trek review. Yeah, thank you, everybody. Because the input in the chat is always so helpful and informative. I, I'm always excited to read what you guys have to say. Yeah, it's a great turnout. And thank you, everybody, for being here. 
Absolutely. So great to see you all. Mm -hmm. And once again, hit the like button on your way out if you haven't done that yet. Yes. And thanks to all the lurkers and anybody watching on the re replay as well. And Gorilla, of course, and feel has free to, to comment. Say, Don't blame me. Oh, he was listening when <laughs> I said that. <laughs> <laughs> I was just kidding. Do Gorilla. That this time. <laughs> he always gets the brunt of the F blame. So oh, I don't know. All day, right? Pop culture, are you going to discuss why the professor couldn't fix the boat? With coconuts. I know. Maybe he needs three coconuts instead of two. Well, I thought the answer was that he went to MIT. I'm sorry. I didn't see the question. Oh, uh, why professor? the professor couldn't fix the boat? He didn't. Like he knows how to do every. He can oh, fix oh, the radio. No. He can no, do no. Everything. What happened? No, they found an adhesive and they glued the boat back together to find out that the adhesive uh, disintegrated and it caused the boat to pretty much explode and fall apart. So at that point, it was they weren't able to put it back together. <laughs> the so SS he did. He admitted it. He, the professor, did discover an adhesive that he made on the island. He was making different kinds of nails, and then he finally came up with a glue type. Oh wow! Rubber. They actually did answer that question. That's awesome. They did answer that question, yes. And Captain Finney's going live, and everybody's giving an F for Gorilla. <laughs> F, F. <laughs> That's funny. F for fantastic. Phantasmagorium. Yes, I had to. Of course, he did. Everybody, go check out what Finney's doing, or you know, go have fun. Uh, enjoy your Tuesday. Let's get the hell out of here. Captain, I'll be listening and driving. Captain's log, star date 3287.2. The course of mass insanity we have tracked across the galaxy seems to have already touched Deneva. Ah, they're here! They're here! You have to tell us what happened to him. Things. Horrible things. Vulcan is no pain. I'm also quite blind.